to the uh, Roundtable podcast for May 5th, 2015. I'm Bear Taffy, joined by Rackley Smile. Matt We're doing Adams themed and, intros now. And yeah, Northern Lion, how are you doing? Hey, what's, what's up? Hi. <laughs> Give me um, your lunch money. I was trying to figure out. You tweeted out extremely roundtable podcast voice live with the roundtable podcast. I think yeah. that's what that voice was. Actually, that voice is any voice coming from a bearded white guy saying the words, yeah, but when's it coming out on PC? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the extremely yeah, roundtable voice. I mean, it pretty might be good, but they don't have a PC demo. I don't know about this. <laughs> Can we get that as a subheader to our, our title uh, underneath roundtable podcast? Quotes, when's it coming out on PC? <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. That's good. I, th I thought you were best. trying to, like, say, w Roundtable Live. Nyeh. Like, I didn't know how you were going to write that oh. out as a sub. No, I like that better, actually. Yeah? Do okay. a like, slide whistle out your nose sound. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, because our SEO is already doing really well. We, I think we need to kind of bring it down a notch. We, we're, we're doing too well there. There's some S Call of Duty trailers in. Yeah. SEO loves those. There we go. SEO? More like SMD. That's what my donger. Oh, yeah. yeah. So close. Uh, mm -hmm. almost so there. close. Almost there. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us again for another week of Roundtable Live. We appreciate you being here. We got some things to talk about. We've got some stuff that's happening. First on the docket, Pray for the Gods changes its name in order to avoid a fight with Bethesda's Prey. The Shadow of the Colossus-esque indie darling forced to undergo a, re a restructuring. Also, player unknown knowns, player unknown knowns, battlegrounds. <laughs> there are known unknowns and player unknowns and player unknown ready for the knowns. sequel. Player unknown knowns, battleground grounds <laughs> has sold two million copies. Wildly, that is for how short of a time that has been out. That is, that is pretty outstanding. So uh, noteworthy in and of itself, which will uh, sort of nicely segue into another bigger conversation we got here. Uh, Xbox chief Phil Spencer recently had a conversation with the Guardian, talking about. How Microsoft needs to develop, quote, the Netflix of video games. And he went at length discussing uh, the industry in its current state, where developers are heading, what they're looking at for uh, new models as far as uh, livelihood of games. Like the, uh, you know, the, the classic debate of whether or not the, the single player narrative is even sustainable anymore, which, you know... History would lend us or lead us to believe it is, but we'll find out. I feel out. like every three years we have this conversation. We do. We need to because <laughs> it's going away if we don't if we don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, also, a little bit of interesting news today: uh, Blizzard reveals its Overwatch loot box rates uh, for China specifically, which I think it's kind of logical to assume that they don't change the loot box drop rates by country. Maybe that's I, I can't think of any logical reason why they would do that. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about that along with uh, the actual law in China that requires Blizzard to do so. Uh, we'll also talk briefly about the Prey demo that's been available this week on the consoles. We'll be uh, talking about that along with Tumble Seed, which just came out on Steam a few days ago. Let's start with Prey for the Gods, a.k.a. Prey for the Gods with the, with the new name change. They're, they've literally changed it to <coughs> P-R-A-E-Y. For the gods, <laughs> I have to. That's the new I have to ask game. if that is just them being like, "Well, if you're gonna pull the legal argument of like, well, we have to defend our trademark. Well, yeah. then we'll do exactly as little as necessary yeah. to get out of the way." <laughs> <laughs> and then in return, they in retaliate yeah. and fight them. They'll create DLC for Prey called "For the Gods." Oh, there it is. <laughs> Perfect. Back and no, no. smack. For the gods, then, with a Z. Oh, P R A E for the gods with a Z. <laughs> so, so, pray for the gods if you're not familiar with it. It was on Kickstarter a little while ago. I believe it got fully funded and they're working on it. It should be slated for release in 2018. Uh, it's, as I mentioned, Shadow, uh, Shadow of the Colossus like. Uh, you are going around gathering resources and taking down these massive enemies, and it looks pretty good. However,. The story here, of course, is that Zenimax is just keeping the keeping the little guy down again. Damn it! Come on, Zenimax, let them have their fun. Let let them make names for games. I don't know, it's not even a name for a game. It's just a fucking word. <laughs> it's just a word. Sometimes, yeah. Like, it's not, I don't understand how they have a legal like discourse over the word prey. 
This they want to own all SEO around it is probably what it is. This, uh, yeah, so that that's what's, that is the ultimate question here. Because this is, it's the word prey, P-R-E-Y. They've clearly gone for the specific spelling, given the fact that they're able to get away with P-R-A-E-Y. So here's my question. Have we run out of names? <laughs> no, we're just using the same five over and over and over again, mostly. But we might be out now, because we're having, like, not only is this a story about the team of Pray for the Gods, the three-man studio, by the way, which is kind of crazy that they're involved in this sort of thing, but uh, Pray for the Gods is, you know, derivative of Prey, apparently, and Prey itself is, is a game that already exists. And I yes. want to harp on this all day yeah. because we have two subjects about this game, but I'm still, <laughs> I'm still bitter about it. They already made a game called Prey. It's ridiculous, well, isn't it? They put the year after it now. That's how you handle this. Yeah. It was Prey 2006 and Prey 2017. Okay, I know. I it's guess crazy. on the one hand, maybe they wouldn't have done anything about it, possibly, if it had happened m not in a year when they were releasing a right. game called Prey. But right. I don't know. It, it seems so petty to us, I feel. to it, Because Prey is not that uncommon of a word. Yeah, so it seems like it's it's really just kind of like exercising I mean, legal like it's a little bit. Quite, quite commonly used when referred to nature and lions hunting. Yeah, I mean it <laughs> it's makes, a fucking word. It really makes sense in the name of this game as well. Pray for the gods. It's like yeah. I that, wonder like how how well that would have held up in court. Well, that's like the interesting went, part too is that you know it never really went to court. Like the story know, here yeah. is that Zenimax is not issuing a cease and desist. They simply denied their uh, initial application for the patent, or for the trademark, rather. So it was... Uh, yeah, let me get the exact wording here for the, uh, the proper legal nomenclature. But I believe it was just straight up Zenimax refused the patent applic or the trademark application. So it never went beyond that. When, when that happened, it's reasonable to assume that uh, the, the team behind Pray for the Gods... I'm trying to look at their developer name but i can't find it oh no matter studios it's reasonable to assume that when no matter studios sees zenimax tell them no their response is oh okay like what are they gonna what are they gonna do right they're not gonna take zenimax to court over the ability to use this name they just can't do it i guess they're, they're just sort of stuck then and there's <laughs> it's it's unfortunate because it does seem like this is just sort of suppressing the little the little guy but in their own press release, they say, like, we thought about fighting it, but we thought it was not really a good use of our limited resources right. to use yeah. Kickstarter money to try to, like, drag this out in court for something that might take forever to get resolved. So, I mean, I understand it. It's just unfortunate. What really sucks is that it's, it's like the Nintendo fan game thing, where it's not like the day you start making the fan game, Nintendo goes... Don't do that. Yeah. It, it, it's only when it picks up traction, which is only when it's like done or nearly done. So it feels like it's a lot of wasted effort. Um, so like if, if Bethesda could have been like, or Zenimax, I guess, could have been like, hey, could you not call it this before the Kickstarter launches? That's one thing. But instead, now that the game is coming closer to release, it kind of like wipes out all of their previous press and SEO to some extent. So I guess just throwing a weird kind of erroneous A into the name is maybe one of the least destructive ways of dealing with that. But when I first Ooh. does look stupid, I'm never going to be able to search for it with that name. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like I, I Google's going to have to autocorrect to help people out. And that's going to look so confusing when it, Google says, did you mean P R A E Y for the gods? But yeah, yeah. it's weird. I, uh, are you sure this isn't really just them wanting to have all the SEO? Because that really feels like the only reason they'd bother. Well, here's the, here's the Bethesda take on it, which is yeah. pretty short. Uh, Bethesda Softworks Vice President Pete Hines uh, said that they didn't, quote, didn't have much of a choice in, a, in regards to opposing the trademark request because if they don't oppose it, they risk losing the Prey trademark, which isn't acceptable, and that's how trademark law works. That's literally their response. And, yeah. I mean, it's, you know... True, right? What are you going to say? That, that is how it so works. They, do they apply for the trademark of just the word pray? Yeah. Why wouldn't they trademark pray for the gods? I don't understand. Then maybe I don't understand what the little guys Well, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. No, I thought you meant Zenimax. Yeah, so I'm... I'm no, no, yeah. I'm, talking I'm about fairly certain guys. no matter was going for the, uh, for the trademark on pray for the gods, but I suppose just because, you know, again, it's derivative of the title. It's... I, I, I couldn't tell you. No, I, I am not a lawyer, but... 
It's just, yeah, it's hard to, I, it's hard to look at this from the outside and not think Zenimax is just, you know, but there is down everywhere. I can sort of understand where they're coming from, but it's, it's really funny to me that they're like, we don't want to be dicks about this, mm. but we have to be dicks. Cause if we're not dicks, we could lose our trademark. And then some other dicks could get the trademark and be dicks to us. So we have to be dicks to protect ourselves from being dicks. So basically, that's the way that it works right now. And, yeah. and that, as far as I know, is just the common belief of how it works and not how it actually works. So it's like two levels deep of people not knowing what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, if, we, if I, I, I like want to kind of take a cynical approach to this and say, well, on the other hand, Zenimax also is the one with the money. And realistically speaking, like they can kind of do what they want if they get like they've got yeah. the upper hand, not only in the ability to apply for those trademarks and sort of uh, broad stroke trademarks initially, but they can also very easily strike down anybody that's attempting to take it away from them in any shape or form. From personal experience, that is how the American legal system works. The person with the money gets their justice. Yeah. The other one doesn't. Yeah, and Zenimax is, yeah, they're big time. They, I mean, shit, they, they got in a damn dispute with Mojang over scrolls. They've got the, they've got the money oh, to yeah, take them to court, too. much less fucking No Matter Studios. I almost wanted to correct you and say you meant to say Mahjong. <laughs> I oh. guess it's been a while <laughs> since I've heard that. Yeah, yeah, Mojang, they're still kicking. Minecraft's still a thing. Weirdly yeah, enough. it's still like the number one selling paid app on still, iOS. Still like now. the most yeah. popular PC game of all time. Yeah. How is that still a thing? <laughs> That's gonna. That game to is our... perfect for children. Like, and I think it will be yeah. for a very long time. It was a. Uh... Man, my, uh, how about that Minecraft? Huh? Gee whiz. Hey, I still play it from time to time. It's an okay game. The last time, yeah, that's a good question. Last time we booted up Minecraft, mine's oh god, probably like five years ago, actually. Yes. Mm. Been a while. It's like less than six months at this point. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get into Minecraft, Mathis? Oh yeah, of course. Oh, that's right. I did Dan. like a, a little series with uh, our good friend Dan Giesling. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> it was great. We never made it to the moon though. Yeah, I remember back in the day doing a series to build a Nether portal. Those were the those were good times. Never made it to the moon. Yeah, we were playing a modded version. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay. <laughs> We were playing. Go uh, to the moon, I guess. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, we're playing the Tech It, tech it Pack or whatever. Oh, it has yeah, like yeah, yeah. A, a planet, planets and moons, and you can fly mm -hmm. off in space. Let's oh. play Elite Dangerous, man. Come on. <laughs> Be real. You can't get out of your ship in Elite Dangerous. The multi crew now, though. Yeah, here it's garbage. Really? Oh, shit. All right. Well, <laughs> anyway, off we go. Dogged item number two Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is super fucking popular, believe it or not. PUBG has sold, sold a whopping. Two million copies. Uh, this is also congruent with the news of them holding a massive charity live stream over the past uh, couple days. No, that was just yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, they finished up yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yeah. Raised themselves a whole bunch of money for charity, so good on them for that. But wow, two mil. That's in so how long has this damn game been out? Now I really need to know, like, the, the time. Watch it be, like, here. two days. It's <laughs> maybe, <laughs> like, in a weird time dilation. <laughs> I think it's six weeks at this point, God. something like that. Just insane. But, it's yeah. got over one meme per day mm -hmm. in our group alone. Release it's actually, like, I know I'm not going to talk about the game. Sure. Because you don't have to do this. It's we've, okay. We've talked about the game enough, <laughs> but they have been supporting it very well yeah, as well yeah absolutely been multiple patches it used to be like when you looked at the big city in the game your frames dropped to like 15. now right. it's like it just when you look at the city it's just normal which is good mm -hmm. they've added like new weapons and vehicles considering that the game is still like relatively new and in early access i think it's a pretty good sign and beyond that it's kind of like this weird self-fulfilling prophecy where Whenever anybody gets into Battlegrounds, they go, oh, you know what's awesome is that when you literally press play, you match instantly. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's <laughs> sincerely the thing that keeps me going after I die is, like, if I just hit play, I'll be in another game within, like, three two or minutes. four seconds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, yeah, I'll be, like, landing in, like, two minutes. So I, I really think that they have done a good job not squandering the goodwill that they've gotten from the audience. And... That's a rarity when it comes to Battle Royale games where... They've, even they've already updated it. 
Well, yeah. Like when H1Z1 was at the height of what I felt was its popularity, the subreddit was still like, I hate everything about this game. So Battlegrounds actually has a surprising amount of community goodwill. Battlegrounds has also had the inadvertent effect of uh, improving H1Z1 players' experience by forcing them to update their game in response to the uh, overall <laughs> popularity of their competition. So that's always good, too. But yeah, this is just, it's, it's wild to think. I mean, it was March 23rd, 2017 that this was released on Steam. So in a little over a month, 2 million copies sold is absolutely insane. Uh, just that, that, that's more of a, just sort of, sort of a scope to put on this next conversation, truth be told, because it does directly. Well, before we get into correlate. that conversation. Yeah, sure. What's up? Ryan, your wife has informed me there's a porn tycoon game now on Steam. What? That doesn't surprise me. Oh, I thought you said poron. I was like, the name is some word I don't know. Give me a oh name. Oh my God, there is. It's a straight up, it's t porn tycoon. Porn and tycoon. If you look it up on Steam, the, there's three O's and there are three tits. Three so, O's? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you tycoon. 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 Just, no, why would you put three? It's only know, in the tycoon. logo. Oh. Wait, is the three yeah. O's in tycoon or porn? Tycoon. In tycoon. Oh. But like yeah. the game's all, name they... doesn't have three O's and you have two O's in the, in the name of the word already and there's two boobs. Like, why wouldn't you just have two boobs instead of three yeah, boobs in the logo? They made, they made three like, boobs for some why? reason. It was like um, Total Recall or something that had the girl with the three, remember, <laughs> yeah. three boobs? Uh -huh. How can you make a game called Porn Studio yet make it feel like work than fun? No naked girls, no sex, complete <laughs> clickbait. Did I mention how there was no sex? I know, right? That's a thumbs down <laughs> from Red Steel. Shit, I don't know if I want this anymore. Oh, most, you, mostly positive, the though. logo. What the, what's that? You can stop right at the logo. That's all the fun you need. Why get into all the other <laughs> all stuff right. and actually buy it? I had way too Ooh. much fun making that thing, man. There are up. many girls in it, but there are no real sex scene unless you consider coffee table shaking as sex scene. <laughs> oh I mean, it God. worked in God of War. I was going to say that's a God of War <laughs> sex scene, so it's got to work for me. No, the, all this art looks like junior and high school art class. Porno That's just what studio. It looks like. I, can you Ooh. scroll Ooh. down to this review that says sure. not recommended 4.4 hours on record and then click expand? This is the most wow. in depth. It is actually wow. like 22 paragraphs. <laughs> wow, that is a long ass review. Porno Studio Tycoon. They've only get paid to write reviews. Incredible. Don't write that much. They've only written well, his first ten sentence, reviews. Like, I mean, he puts puts it right what he was where where his mind was at. Man, he 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 feels like he bought this game for nudity and later discovered it also has a few economical elements to it. Got, got very happy and left all those positive reviews. Mm -hmm. Oh, so he must have left a few positive reviews in the past. Yeah. Well, how could you like this? There are no real sex scene. Yeah. <laughs> Only two things stand out in the game design that bug me. One, okay, no nudity, that's okay. If I wanted to look at people having sex, I wouldn't bother with a game. I'd just watch my neighbors. But the game has <laughs> a massive black bubble that <laughs> you're filming, and I find it so distracting, it's wrecking the game for me. Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> I'd watch my neighbors? I thought they were going to make a humble brag and be like, I'd just have sex with my girlfriend. <laughs> no, I'm going to look out and peep on my neighbors. That's what his plan is. He didn't say he wants to be the naked people. He says he wants to see the naked people. Have a Very look, Chad. Distinction. Have a look at this. This guy, he goes Born hard in the motherfucking paint with this stuff. Nobody has critiqued the logo, though, and that bothers yeah, me. Yeah, no, this needs this needs some uh, hardcore analysis. I'll let it run for two weeks and then just review the logo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't want to get I want to get flagged, so I'll go go ahead and take that down. Porno Studio Tycoon, gee whiz. Who doesn't want to have some chicks? Totally <laughs> no porn scenes. Can't take screenshots. Not what? recommended. What? Zero point two hours on record. <laughs> Can't take screenshots. So their plan oversight. was to create porn for themselves in this game. Ugh. It's wild, man. What's the? Uh, it's just Honey Pop. No, it looks worse than Honey worse Pop. Than honey Pop, Pop was a match three game. Honey Pop this was good, not... man. Come honey on. Pop was good. Oh man, Honey <laughs> Pop was a good match three game. All right, I will defend that game. All right, Honey Cam Studio, not so much. Yeah. All right. All right. <sighs> yeah, anyway. 
Player unknowns. Player unknown. Battlegrounds is also adding two new maps in a future patch. Really? Oh, Ergo, nice. giving a rebuttal to one of the most common complaints about battle royale games that they have the exact same map every game. Right, but like that's Sports part of Dota. the appeal for a lot of folks. I think is the fact that they're able to study and learn the one map so intricately. Right? Even in like yeah, but you only need to know two places. C dot. C dot. On Hospi, yeah, Hospi and C dot. Right. If you can't hit C dot, you can hit Hospi and vice versa. C dot. Well, only if you can pump properly. You got to learn to pump and hump. Is it C dot or C dot? It's C, C, C dot. C dot. C dot. No, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> Do a little bit of a like yeah, seizure a at the end. A twitch in there too. C dot. <laughs> R.I.P. Austin. R.I.P. Oh man, I hope he's okay, man. Shit, he's been pooping a lot. Yeah, right. I asked him today if he was dead, and he said he was not dead. That's good. Well, he said, I don't think I'm dead. Yeah. Which, you know, when you don't tweet he for 18 it. hours, you got to ask. Mm -hmm. Something big has happened to the video game industry over the last five years. You may have noticed. All the old rules about consoles. All the old rules about games just working out of the box. They're all fucking gone, man. Out the fucking window. Those days are over. Now, Phil Spencer wants to make the Netflix of video games. That's, uh, that's what he said in an interview with The Guardian. Sat down and described a lot of the, uh, the struggles of modern game development. This actually makes me think of a, uh, uh, an article that came around, I think, a couple weeks ago as well. It was Cliffy B talking about the fact that uh, modern AAA development is, quote, basically unsustainable. I do want to point out one of the things that's changed the most in the past five years would probably be Microsoft's specific fortunes within the video game industry. Yeah. yeah. Though the I can Xbox sort of one destroyed them. Yeah. I can sort of understand. Not to be, I mean, we're gonna get into this, I'm yeah, sure, but yeah. not to be too like anti Xbox One, but I can understand why he's the guy saying it. But it's, I mean, it also stands to reason that he's the guy having these conversations because they are in a position where they got to figure out what the fuck to do, right? So Maybe next time, don't market your console as a sports washing machine. Yeah, fucking I, moron. I know I say this every time. It doesn't turn on right. <laughs> yeah, like have it turn as, on. Kate's in chat right now. Ask her if we want to watch a Blu-ray. Ask her how many times we have to turn the console on and off. <laughs> I don't you believe you. It's madness. But maybe ours is just broken, and that's and that doesn't mean that they're all broken. But ours is broken. Hmm. I think it's a higher than then zero chance of that being true that it's got a problem. But I think a lot of them have a problem. I mean, other people own Xbox Ones. How, I feel like I would be seeing a lot more people being like, yeah, I have to turn it on like five times to get it to work. Mine needs to load for ridiculous amounts of time, even just on the home screen. Mm. So I don't know if that's sort of partially a symptom of that. I've echoed your position on this because I do more or less have to reset the Xbox every time I, I want to actually do something on it. Anyway... The, uh, the focal point of the article here in the interview is the uh, conversation around video games as a service, which has been, of course, increasing in popularity over the last few years. Games like Destiny and The Division, for example, are uh, heavily ingrained in the idea of keeping the single game afloat and uh, supporting it with things like DLC, new content packs, and uh, season passes and all that kind of stuff. So... This conversation, of course, we want to discuss whether or not that's going to be the uh, the future of games for the uh, for the foreseeable future. But we also have a conversation to take place about single player games because, in uh, Phil Spencer's mind, it seems as though the uh, the market for these is slowly going away. And like Matt has said, we have this conversation a lot. You know, like the, the where where is the money going to come for single player games now? Who's going to fund these? three to four hour projects like inside and like little nightmares so that you know don't have a ton of replay value and are 20 bucks a pop and you know it's a difficult sell for a lot of folks who's gonna fund that kickstarter kickstarter right <laughs> mm. problem solved yeah so uh he let me let me just take this quote because i think it's uh, pertinent to the conversation he says the audience for those big story driven games i won't say it isn't large but they're not as consistent You'll have things like Zelda or Horizon Zero Dawn that'll come out and do really well, but they don't have the same impact that they used to have because, because the big service-based games are capturing such a large amount of the audience. Which you is know, very what true. that says Pretty to sure. me is like they want it both ways. They want to be able to predictably create games that are a new experience in a new IP mm -hmm. and guarantee that they'll make them lots and lots of money. Oh, sure, yeah. 
And that's where their frustration comes from. It's not that they don't want to make those games. They just don't know that they'll get return on investment. So why bother? Mm. For them, it's just to make a multiplayer game. I know those will sell. Yeah, yeah. make another Call of Duty. All right, I kind of, to say that Zelda didn't have an impact kind of, yeah, fuck off. Way. What is that even supposed <laughs> no, to mean? I mean, I am not, I am not the, the most... <laughs> I, I don't love Zelda, and honestly, the more I played it, the more I ended up disliking it, but I still think it's in a great game mm. overall. And the, and I, honest to God, think Zelda's going to have a huge impact on open-world games t- for years Oh, yeah, I, I genuinely believe Please that. Please tell me it's not the weapon degradation, though, if anything. <laughs> oh, oh it's I'm with the, you. I think it's got to be like that, that sense of freedom and exploration that was just... They, there's never been a game like that. Not an open-world game like that before, so I think that alone is going to be something just, that carries I, over. I think he's fucking has his head up his own ass if he thinks Zelda isn't going to make an impact in any way. Well, it really... I think it just sort of reeks of like hey 10 years ago gears of war sold like 11 million copies but now kids these days are all playing league of legends instead like yeah. right. you know, it's a bad shift for the industry which i don't think i necessarily agree with it's a bad shift for his industry right yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. unfortunately that means the whole industry is doomed <laughs> the other thing is like you 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 can't cut it both ways and i'm not specifically saying microsoft has done this but so many AAA publishers recognized that there was a shift in this direction like five or six years ago and they made really really bad mobas and oh they never caught on and and like you act, they have to still be good it's not like people are ignoring all art to just play you, games that are, are like you telling me the lord of the rings moba for xbox 360 <laughs> what bothers game. me is that guardians of middle earth is actually a good game <laughs> but it's it's impossible to fight for for many reasons one of which is every other game in the lobby crashed the other one is that it's the lord of the rings theme moba which is a, a tough sell to begin with but that game was okay but like <laughs> seriously like even now i'm not trying to insult it but i played a little of um unreal's new moba oh the most Par- bland moba ever. paragon paragon yeah. and it, that's I, I had exactly the same opinion i was like you can tell there's like 200 people working on this game and like none of them have a heart in it that's it's you i played it and i was like this is like bad smite like, it's, <laughs> it's just like sincerely like there was no joy or or fun in it at all and it's just such a cynical development process that it really i mean at least to me it seemed like they were like mobas are ki- killing it which is ignorant but mobas are killing it let's make like a triple a moba but it's got no soul it, it, it reminds me of like the the mmo gold rush back when wow hit it big and people were like this is gonna be the next thing and we had a thousand MMOs hit the scene all trying to do the same thing, all of them mostly mediocre to bad and the, the industry just flopped and you, you were left standing with like two or three really good MMOs and everything else was, was dead or free to play and the MOBA seems the same way you had League of Legends hit it off, Dota 2 came in and was like okay well you know we, we've created this and they, they rose to the top and then every company washed in with their take and what left standing smite yeah yeah and like what else <laughs> like that's it so well i mean just uh, to butt in and here is like, the storm right yeah of course but i also i kind of take issue with the the quote and admittedly it might be out of context where he says like we need to create a netflix of video games do it then you are the one with the money like what do you mean we need to create a Netflix of video games? Because here's what Netflix is for me, is for like $14 a month, I get unlimited amounts of video games. Now, if you want to yeah. do that, I would love for you to do that, but it also comes with some caveats. You're not going to be able to sell $60 standalone single-player games as consistently if you come out with a service that actually emulates that. And beyond that, the reason Netflix is going so strong is because they're investing money hand over fist to buy cool original series. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, they, yeah. like they're, I don't know if they're working at a loss or anything like that, but they are like seriously pumping so much money into original content generation. And without being overly cynical, the AAA video game industry is like allergic to new IPs. Like the games that people are excited about are largely, remember that game from 10 years ago that, got unfairly shelved before we really got a chance to blossom well we're gonna bring that back now like that's as original as it gets is yeah. like an old idea reimagined yeah. so like put your money where your mouth is honestly if you if you want to go that route because it, it, it falls in his court 
him even saying like he wants to make the Netflix of, uh, uh, of video games. Like, well, isn't that PlayStation now? Mm. Supposedly, isn't that right. Xbox Live as well? Like, they give you a well, game they, every yeah, month. Yeah, so think about this. So, like, the services like PlayStation now and, like, Game Pass now with the Xbox, they, they I think that's where they want to start it because the, the, article, the article actually makes this uh, point, but that's how Netflix started up as a digital service where they were, like, a repository for older movies and weren't necessarily, like, you know, how they are now where they're at the forefront of creating new original content for their service. I think, like, they're, they're looking at maybe a comparable model and transition with something like the Game Pass where they're using it in that mode now but maybe later on down the road they are going to you know open up the floodgates a bit there to allow smaller studios the opportunity to latch on to that and be able to get funding that way as part of their you know monthly subscription service that's you sort of game what they're pass and at. i have flashbacks to yeah. those little cardboard cards and, and games that you couldn't get oh. online <laughs> stuff unless you had the pass that was like their old version of drm back in the day yeah. mm -hmm. i don't know I'm I was, as the pro-corporation guy here, even I'm reading this and I'm like, a lot of these quotes strike me as like, how do you do fellow teens? Like there's a quote in here where this dude says, I mean, I'm old enough. I remember horse armor. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> wow. wow. Good oh, for man, you, bro. What, what a callback. Well, back in the day, uh, no one ever remembers horse armor. We were struggling. <laughs> that was... It was like 11 years ago, man. Yeah. You're 47. <laughs> we're, we're in our in our 20s or early 30s. And we remember horse armor. Like that doesn't. That's your it, it, like that's emblematic of what you think is wrong with the industry right now. Is that you remember Wait, horse yeah, armor? That's also in what pretty, context did he mean that? <laughs> that's a pretty easy punch to throw, man. Let's all fucking throw horse armor under the bus again. They haven't heard it well, enough. Is his solution going to remove shit like aggressively and overreaching DLC? Because I don't see that as being a, a solution in the Netflix of games. Does he want to make more? He, he uses that as kind of like a supporting point for not wanting paywalls in games, which I, I mean, there is tangential to the point, I think. I also cannot think of a game I've ever played where there's a paywall, unless we're talking right. about stuff like episodic games, I guess. But so I his think, means is to rewrite the entire way the industry works so his Netflix idea can work in this industry. Uh, I, I actually just don't know. I mean, like, so he is speaking... This is a pretty candid conversation, so let's not, like, you know, hyper-focus on any particular thing he says here, too. But he's discussing the idea of, you know, like, this model will help smaller studios. It's the focus is on let's allow these teams like uh, the the uh, the inside team and the little nightmares team to not have to worry about where they're getting their money from and, you know, create a medium for them to make these three to four hour little uh, nutshell experiences. It's it's less like I think it's less of a of a conversation about how to make money in an increasingly games as service driven industry and more about how we continue to uh to allow smaller studios to keep up in that industry well i i actually do agree with him that i think the industry has shifted away from triple a tentpole releases to some extent like even just in the short time that i've been in the industry back in like 2012 or 2013 it seemed like every week I was looking up like, okay, what's the big game that's releasing this week? Right. You know, like a yeah. game like Anarchy Reigns got press. Anarchy Reigns is, this yeah. is like pre everyone even discovering that Platinum is sort of cool. That game was just kind of boring, not that bad, but it was the biggest release for a week in January. So it reached like some level of press and success. Yeah. And now, and I, I mean, admittedly part of this is personal, but I feel like less than chasing the newest big release it's sort of more people have communities that they've developed surrounding games and they're less diverse in what they play so like there's a huge overwatch league dota you know heroes yeah. of the storm hearthstone etc etc player unknown battlegrounds h1z1 community um and that means that it is a tough business decision to be like hey we're going to spend like 15 million dollars or 30 million dollars developing a triple a single player experience but is that because those games are great and being ignored or 
are we reaching like a certain level of, of malaise and disinterest in the consumer base because so many of them ended up being rehashes? It strikes me as disingenuous and also quite frustrating that he can't seem to get this idea out of his head that like this is what the point of publishers are, right? Like he's in the position to fund these things that he is afraid to take risks on and wants to mitigate that risk by putting it onto someone else. So he wants oh, to reap yeah. the rewards of someone else taking the risk and him getting to collect the check at the end of the day. Right. So that, that's why that frustrates me, that whole thing. Like it, that's mm. the way it's always worked is the publisher finds the good idea and then they work together to sell it. I, I want to, part of this is, I think is on the writer as well. And I'm not trying to rag on him, but mm. they really do use the worst examples to support Phil Spencer's point. Like it, uh, let me find the quote here, but it says like on the one hand, Oh yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's the, uh, yeah, let me, let me, Control F Rust. Yeah. Yeah. On the plus side, <laughs> what this may mean is more innovative independent developers working on persistent world experiences like DayZ, Rust, or players on player unknowns battlegrounds. Those games are the wrong example. Yes. They're they're killing it already. Like none of those developers should be hurting for money. They're enormous successes. Player unknowns battlegrounds have sold two million copies. It's like what after you factor out Steam's cut, that's forty million dollars of revenue in sales a month <laughs> yeah. yeah so like these are terrible examples for like let's support the little guy but maybe with with something more Some... like actually resonant it would make sense but he but... does bring up inside within the article as well actually as another but guy, didn't but... inside also did do it, fine did it? i like remember we talked it was a round table thing that I'll company played play dead was valued at like like nine million euros or something really? like that oh, which is God. I mean, I don't want to speak without actually having the number in front of me, but I thought we were all surprised at the valuation of Play Dead. Yeah. I mean, that sounds vaguely familiar, but yeah, I mean... What is it? What's the website you use? Is it Steam Charts Steam or Spy. Steam? Steam Spy. Yeah. Um, sorry, totally lost my train of thought it's, now, but... So it's like a person that's a bit out of touch with the industry writing about a person who's also out of touch with the industry... And both of them are coming to a conclusion. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say Phil Spencer's out of touch with the industry. It seems like it based on the way he's talking about. This seems very short-sighted. Inside has on Steam uh, around 330,000 owners. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, that is much better than I thought. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Limbo has got... Infinity. A lot more, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of feel like it's also it's trying to Over solve four million of problem <laughs> that's like already solved, yes, to some extent because we don't have a true Netflix like games as a service. By the way, people hate software as a service most of the time. Like everybody that does the calculation is like, I hate that Adobe has switched to software as a service because now I've paid like fifteen hundred dollars for photoshop oh, or could get forced yeah. into it yeah i could have just yeah. bought a lifetime license for like 400 bucks mm. and yeah that's a lot worse than ten dollars a month for the first little bit but eventually like it becomes kind of an exploitative model but the the analog that we have to that right now to, to enter into our own circle jerk is that you wait six months and then you buy whatever games you want on steam a la carte for like 25 percent of their original purchase price so like that model already exists. What doesn't exist anymore is, uh, at least I think, hey, this game came out two and a half years ago. I have to go to the store and buy it for 60 bucks because it's not well, on sale yet. Now you just wait three years and it comes back re-released on Steam. Right, yeah. But works <laughs> less effectively and doesn't change anything good. But it's $60, so, yeah. you know, Bulletstorm, yeah. whatever. But by all means, I would really support microsoft if they said we're going to invest far too much money into making like an actual netflix for games yeah and it, it, it doesn't have to be that every game that comes out is immediately on netflix you know i'm i'm fine with rotating stuff on and rotating stuff off I, my hunch is that the optics for that make no sense at all and that if you spend let's say like 50 million dollars developing your game you don't want to put it on netflix and get like a dollar per user six months later but has an awful deal and that's the same model He's the Why one who they said just, they needed a Netflix for video games. Why don't they just fund some fucking indie studios like they did and then realized it was a bad idea? Why did they realize it was a bad idea? We're not sure. They just decided to stop. And it, I mean, we're kind of raking them over the coals for policies that are 
five years old at this point or four years old. But I mean, they were the ones that had the regressive indie model in the first place that was actually exploitative to indie developers where, oh, yeah. you know, if you wanted to come out on Xbox One, that's fine. We'll let you, but it has to be on Xbox yeah. One. Like, I'm not sure if it was exclusive or it had to launch concurrently on Xbox One with every other platform simultaneously. Mm. Um, but I, I think they backtracked on that one. I wanted What's unfortunate is the only option at the time, really, if you wanted to get on console, was you could go through Xbox Live Arcade. So that yeah. sort of became the leverage that studios had to then eventually get onto Wii or somewhere else. And now that there is better out there, like they don't have that leverage anymore and they don't know what to do to exploit anyone anymore. Arcade was, it's, arcade was good. I felt like arcade. I liked was good. Arcade, arcade a lot. Did, yeah, like, it, I bought tons of games on that. But I think arcade only worked because of how small the the marketplace was for that at the time. I think like yes. it wouldn't work in today's environment at all. And I I want to try to speculate a little bit more about what this would actually be too, because when we look at again trying to create an analog for what we already have, we have something like the humble monthly bundle, for example, which I think is the closest possible comparison as far as this offering goes. And that's been, you know, fairly popular, and it's it's something that I think people have been willing to take a chance on. And I think Microsoft could create something akin to that, and even more so, like akin almost entirely to Netflix, where, you know, they've got Game Pass already, but why not just go ahead and throw some new titles in the mix? Why not, why not make the incentive higher to to actually sign up for that service you know do some playstation plus style style stuff just give things away and start to get people more interested in the idea of subscribing to something on a monthly basis that might give them uh, a new game that they wouldn't have otherwise discovered they can do something like that they, they could they could do it right now i'm not sure why they wouldn't are you saying xbox live because they do that now well, yeah, with the games with gold, right? But I'm saying, like, with new games, with, like, brand new games, because with games with gold, you're just getting the old shit, oh, right? Oh, why I'm would they give with... away games they could get $60 for, though? <laughs> I mean, I'm saying, well, if you want to create a new system like this, you got to incentivize people to actually sign oh, up for it first, right? Just get I mean, the Rocket $60 League was given away right. to Yeah, exactly. Right Rocket away. League is a prime example of this, and it worked perfectly. With PlayStation Plus, it was widely successful, and people got their hands on it and were able to see that it was a good game, and then, you know... The rest is history as far as that's concerned. Was it PS Plus when it first came out? Yeah, it was it was the I'm it was on almost positive that it was, it was like the like month of release right it was away. PlayStation Plus for free, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. I mean get an install base right away. I I still to some extent understand conceptually his point, although I sort of disagree with it. It is, I imagine, if you're the one signing the checks, tough to be like Here's, I mean, $15 million is not a lot of money to make a video game. Like a triple A AAA video game oh, probably yeah, yeah. costs like 10 times that. Well, okay, maybe like four times that or something like that. But like the optics or the numbers start to become difficult as less and less people are like, well, I'm like paying $60 for a game is not as normalized as it was like five years ago, I think. You, we see it all the time in the comments for our videos. Mm -hmm. We play like an indie game that's 15 bucks. People are like, why would I play this for 15 bucks i got a thousand hours out of league and i've only put you know 15 dollars into, into that it, yeah. game exactly so i mean it's a it's a tough value proposition especially because if your game is a 10 people are still going to be like it's expensive and if it's a six everybody's going to laugh at you and everybody right. in the studio is going to lose their jobs mm -hmm. and it's going to be a huge financial loss so there was a sweet spot though in like 2008 to 2012 where they got away with constantly selling $60 games. I think that it wasn't quite pushed away from like Xbox Live Arcade and Steam wasn't quite as big and indie games didn't have quite the leverage they do now. Yeah. And I, I think they got it into their head. This is their Leave it to Beaver 50s glory days. Yeah. So we need to get back <laughs> to that time now. And so because it's not that time, something's fundamentally wrong with the industry and we have to rethink it all. They just don't quite get that maybe that was an inflated expectation to begin with. I'm looking at this, too, from just, you know, my perspective of, like, how I value games now, which is obviously skewed based on my job. But, I mean, most of my life, I've not played a huge variety of games. I've kind of, you know, I now obviously that's changed. But like, I, I would play just a few games and I would try to get the most out of them. And yeah. I think that has become exacerbated now. I think if I was growing up, like, 
if I'm a 16 year old right now, I'm probably playing three games that I've spent maybe a total of 20 bucks on, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I don't see why I shouldn't either. So I I think like you, you're you're right in that like the the golden age of that sixty dollar release is just, it, it, it's it isn't sustainable anymore. I don't think. I mean, they're still doing it obviously, so well, it's still working to a certain extent, but it's just. They tried to push it further by making more and more collector's editions and more things that are $100 to kind of like offset the few less $60 games that would come in. Yeah. And it's like there is a breaking point to this, yeah. and the industry isn't necessarily sustainable on that idea. They just really wanted it to be. <laughs> <laughs> the $60 sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, Man, there's... remember Vampire Rain, Nick? Yeah. That was, $60. <laughs> that was a great $60, $60 vampire stealth game. So, here we go. I remember what's selling the, uh, a lot of four ninety nine copies of that that came back. <laughs> what's the what's the sixty dollar purchase you most regret? Can you think of it? Hmm. Maybe even on Maybe Day? the orange box on console. What? what the that? Oh, yeah. wait, because yeah, I, I got it on it. PC for nothing. But, but like, yeah, but... come on though. <laughs> that's no, like I ended up never even playing it because like, I got it on PC. That's gotta be like one of the most universally loved games, especially the package, the orange no. box. It's like, how can you possibly? I'm like saying like, imagine box. you bought TF2 for full price yeah, yeah. and then it went free I right after. You. That's all I mean. Ew. I'm not saying it's bad. When did you buy it though? I don't remember. Because it went free a to play. A while after. It went free to play in like 2011. It was just bad timing on my part. I'm not blaming yeah, them. Yeah. Mine's still the Master Chief Collection, <laughs> bar none. That, was, that, <laughs> that makes sense. sense. That was a fucking mistake. Probably like 40% of the Super Nintendo games I owned. Mm. Is, once I got to the point where I was spending my own money on games, I really... I was at the point where I could at least crack open like a game pro or something yeah. and be like, this is bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I think it could, I, I, I like the, the concept honestly. And I think it's something that we'll probably see in some shape or form in the next few years. And Microsoft, I mean, it makes sense for them too. They've got, it's, it mentions in the article too, but they've got like their whole cloud server platform which is a big incentive for uh smaller studios too because that's not the kind of thing that they can generally avoid or afford so they've i mean they they just they've got the foundation i think i agree with you guys in that well if you want to do it fucking do it you know like it's onus is on you there isn't like humble monthly bundle kind of well, that's what I was the saying. same yeah, idea it's... in a like an off kilter kind of indirect way yeah it's similar and the monthly is is actually so good and it's still hard to get people to care about it. And I think this is what actually makes the Netflix comparison not one-to-one, -one, is that on Netflix, you're not going to watch the same movie 10 times. At least the average person is not going to be like, that like is the best Mike. movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like, For the, what am I going to do with my next 20 hours? I'm going to watch Tropic Thunder nine times. Like, that's what I do. <laughs> in but a row, back to back. You can't, in my opinion at least, you can't beat the fact that people are entrenched in free-to-play multiplayer communities by just coming out with games that are a year and a half to three years old on a subscription-based service because you still, if you're into League of Legends, you're like, okay, I could play League of Legends for free or for $12 a month, I could play like, I'm trying to think of, you know, um, Murdered Soul Suspect or something like mm. that. Like, it still comes across almost as a waste of time that you really... Like, right now, if you gave me access to, like, every game that came out in 2015, let's just say, I would still want to spend my free time playing Player Unknown Battlegrounds. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I like it, and I find it rewarding to get better in that game versus being like, okay, here's a 7 out of 10 game from 2015 that I could mess around with for a little bit. You know, the, the yeah. same is not true for movies or TV shows. You can rewatch them, but eventually, you know, I mean, there's probably people out there who do this, but you're probably not going to watch The Office over and over. And as soon as you finish it, start it again over and over Good and God, over. God, I know somebody who does that. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you. No, it doesn't I swear surprise. to you. I know somebody who will, who just for the past X number of years is just Office. And once they reach the last episode, they will restart right it. Right on S1, E1, man. Yep. But that is definitely not it's the just, case for the majority of people. I don't think the Netflix model works the same for this industry, and I think it's forcing it to try and have it be that way. Uh, if you want games, you can buy them, but I'm tired of paying for things up front that I don't know what they are yet. 
the Humble Monthly Bundle, thankfully, seems very well curated, so that's kind of an exception. But I usually don't trust people to curate that kind of stuff and charge me before I know what I'm buying. Yeah, it's usually a bad deal. And you're probably not in the minority either. And I mean, like, this is the, the Humble Monthly has been around, surprisingly, for like over a year now. And they, they clearly have been doing well enough to keep it going. But right. even with how good it's been, like, just looking at the last few months, yeah, they're, they're doing really well. They're getting, they're getting, they're picking really solid stuff. But like he said, it's just, it's still not really that popular. And I don't think there's a lot of folks that are interested in the model. The thing is, like, when I was doing the sponsored thing for XCOM 2, you're like, it's, the, it's actually the greatest deal I could possibly give you. It's a $60 game. It's never been on sale for less than $30. What's the dream deal? We'll give it to you for 12 and then also like seven other games yeah. that are, as, pre as of present, kind of a grab bag. Like, we don't know what they are yet. But people were still like, eh, it's a good deal, but I just sort of largely don't care. We, I think we have almost like, <laughs> and I, as far as I'm concerned, this is sweet for us, yeah. but there's almost like a supply issue in the industry. There's too much. Where there's yeah. there's yeah. too much great stuff. Mm -hmm. And like just a deal being good doesn't actually matter anymore. Like we're, you probably are at the point where if you got like a game, maybe this is out of touch. But I feel like if, for most people, if they have games that they really like, they spend a lot of time playing and they can play it into perpetuity. If you gave them a free game that is less than great, why would they play it? Like, I, I feel like there's no motivation to really be like, ah, I'm going to go check out, you know, yeah. Army of Two, Two. And the only way, place that motivation can be made up for is if they just don't know any better which is right. kind of a big motivation for why sometimes PR gets a little confusing. Uh, you want to purposely obfuscate things. If you have something you're trying to sell, you don't know what you're basing it on. So I don't know. I, I agree. That's, it's a bit complicated. There's too many good things and that's not really a problem, but it can be a problem. I wonder now, like we're getting kind of down to the brass tacks of this, but I wonder how many people are actively looking for new things to play at all. You know, like, well, somebody, because they're watching us, right? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, there's obviously a, a contingent of folks that are aware, but I I mean, maybe I, it would be an interesting sort, sort of uh, study to see, but I really wonder like whether or not, in a general sense, people's interest has sort of lessened over the last few years in new upcoming releases. Not necessarily only because they're inundated with things to play already, but also because like Ryan said, like there's, there's options that are so cheap. It's almost yeah. unnecessary, you know, it, like they, they, they don't really need to find new things. And it's a matter of framing. I mean, there is the difference between actively going and looking for things to buy versus this thing happened to float into my peripheral sure, vision yeah. and now I want it. Right? right. And I think a lot of people that we would deal with and talk to you are kind of in the latter category where they're not looking, but things find them. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, we're starting to create an industry around in a way. Right. I mean, we want that as content creators, but do we want that? Maybe. <laughs> it's a little too inside baseball, that. right? <laughs> <laughs> really Didn't mean there. to break your brain there a little bit. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Anyway, that was good. But uh, see what comes of all that. Games is I mean, superstar. all I'm trying to say is you never need to buy another video game if you have rocket league hearthstone and player unknowns battlegrounds <laughs> if you have those three sad, video games dude. you don't you don't even need to watch the show anymore because you can play those until you die yeah you're as long as the servers stay up you're fine they won't though what do you think is going to happen first the servers of those games go down or the heat death of the universe mm, you don't want a straight answer to that one yeah, i, don't wanna know. I thought you were gonna ask which order do you think the servers are going to go down question. i yeah, think <laughs> There you go. Rocket League will be around the longest. Yeah? To be it's honest. Freaking Deadpool of video game servers. <laughs> I think the smart money would be on Hearthstone outlasting player unknowns battlegrounds. I'd say so. I agree with because, that. Because a couple of reasons. I love battlegrounds. I think it is conceivable that another battle royale could eclipse it. I agree. I think it's almost inevitable, honestly. Like, I'm pretty sure this is gonna be a flavor of the year sort of situation. It is it's huge though yeah. like I, for context 
like this is not just big. This is it's a massive. huge mm. game. Like it it has more concurrent players right now than Rocket League does. Which two years ago meant nothing at all. But right, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, what eight players? But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's wild, wild, wild west of games as a service, man. It's crazy shit these days. Blizzard. Well, there you go. Back to Hearthstone. Made Hearthstone. Yeah. Speaking of which, <laughs> loot boxes. They've revealed their probability dro- or uh, drop rate probabilities uh, for the country of China. So if you're curious, epic items are open on average every 5.5 loot boxes. Legendary items open on average. Every 13.5 loot boxes. If you want to do the math on that, uh, I thought this article had, but apparently it's they have a <laughs> 7.4% wanna... chance to get a legendary. Okay. 18.2% chance to get an epic. There you go. There you go. So if you're ever curious, now you know, and it's probably safe to assume that those uh, drop rates apply to every country, not just China. But. Uh, there's uh, another conversation to be had around this. The reason that Blizzard was forced to reveal these rates is because there's actually a law in China that uh, dictates they do so. And, you know, I, I got to thinking about it. They are more or less like a lottery, right? I mean, it is, it's kind of a, a, a glorified well, slot machine. Yeah, what's the more or less? I mean, it's very directly yeah, that. It's pretty much gambling, right? Except you never win. <laughs> right if you can substitute the currency for just endorphins yeah, it's yes, gambling. yeah yeah so uh so with the chinese law requiring them to uh reveal those probability rates do you feel that america should have something similar i kind of do sure yeah what's the harm right like i i wonder why it, it isn't in place already because I, I, well, I also wonder really how much they're looking into loot boxes in general. Maybe this is going to be one of those uh, big new scandals that once it once it is in the eyes of the actual uh, you know legal yeah. decision makers in this country, they'll they'll figure out. Oh man, yeah, they've been oh. kind of getting away with one here. Probably not here right now, but I, I would say that uh, as a matter of oversight, it is probably a great practice to be able to know if they're just setting up a thing that never pays out. Right, yeah. Hopefully What's not. What's the downside to that? Mm-hmm. I mean, what would stop you from creating a casino that never gives you any money back until someone figured that out? You ever, like, look at... You know, you have, like, scratch and save things at a local, you know, department store or something like that? Uh, the legalese... I, you know, you, you buy... Maybe it's a Canadian thing. I don't know. Uh, sometimes the uh, promotions, you go up and you're like, hey, I'm going to buy this stuff. And they go, okay, here's a scratch and save ticket. You scratch it and it has like a percentage on it and you get that percentage off your bill. Oh, huh. And if you have, cool. it, I was Another thing you could think of is like... That's fun. Yeah. Like McDonald's Monopoly stuff. Yeah. That, yeah, they that was rigged. They arrested yeah, the was. Yeah, but I'm just saying, <laughs> if, if you read... If you read the legalese on those promotions, it's like an essay's length. You know, it's like, must be a legal resident of blah, blah, blah. Right. We're excluding these states or these provinces. You know, if you have ever known anybody who's ever worked at a McDonald's, like they can't win any yeah. prizes from this game. Mm-hmm. You can't exchange prizes, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Whereas in Overwatch, a game that I actually like a great deal, uh, you just buy the boxes. Right. To the best of my knowledge, it doesn't put up any warning text. Yeah, that you don't like, have to check you know, a box that says I agree to the terms and conditions of the loot box purchasing system. So it's kind of like a little lawless. Although I will say, at the same time, when you buy like Magic the Gathering packs, you know, the dude at the store doesn't go, oh, you know, 6% chance to get like a golden, or sorry, a, <laughs> what they, a foil mythic, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's, it's been, been a while. while. Right, yeah. <laughs> golden <laughs> snitch in there. <laughs> Thinking about Hearthstone there for a second. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> I... I Probably not to the surprise of many people. I feel like they should make it transparent. I don't really feel like it's going to... If if they did, I don't think it would diminish the amount of people who purchased loot boxes because I think people, as, assuming the percentages are reasonable, they're still going to chase the loot. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, think about like Fire Emblem Heroes. They show you right there. You can <laughs> just click a button. It'll show you the probabilities for the drops. And I don't think that discourages people. In fact, I think that encourages people because the percentage goes up, the more... Uh, orbs you use unsuccessfully, quote unquote. Well, 
Oh, oh extremely round table voice. Hold on. Su yeah. Subsequent purchases are more efficient <laughs> yeah. because yeah, the more right. the more orbs you use in one purchase, the more heroes you get mm -hmm. and the cheaper per hero costs. That's true. You That's have. True. That but is accurate. I Honestly, the lower the percentages are, I think the more bragging rights people feel like they have when they hit it. Yeah. That's so, like, I don't see yeah. it as a bad thing in any direction that showing those numbers would, like, hurt anyone. Yeah. It would just be good. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, Why don't they? Hopefully they do. I like it. Yeah, I really would appreciate it. <laughs> hopefully they learn from this. Uh, but, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it's just a little interesting tidbit there, too. All right. Hey, Mathis. Hey, Bear. You want to talk about the Prey demo? No, I'll talk about the pray full game. Oh shit! Whoa! This guy got the early access. You just huh? stepped your game no, the off. Oh my! The game's God. out today, man. It's not a. Oh my God. Really Didn't see that coming? Right. I know. I sure oh. didn't. Here we go. Here we go. Tell me about Prey then. Prey is Arcane Studios' newest game. People who did Dishonored One and Dishonored Two. Uh, it is. I heard it's like Bioshock in space. It is. Yeah. It is. So, <laughs> what I was yeah, going to say. Is. <laughs> I'm making is, a troll face right now, by the yeah, way, if you good, can't see me. It's a good face. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it is basically <laughs> System Shock. <laughs> it, 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 it opens. The opening 40 minutes are awesome. Yeah, um, it is really cool. I don't know really about cool. the demo, mm -hmm. but the opening 40 minute, minutes of the game, like, I kept myself pretty away from the game. Um, were, it was a mind fuck. It was great. I loved it. Uh, but it is very much system shock um, in that there's leveling and skills, uh, three different trees in, in which you can level things up. You can be better at like hacking or uh, better at just like lifting things and throwing them more health, uh, repairing things. You also, uh, much like a system shock and of course Bioshock, start with a wrench. You get a wrench right out the yeah. gate and just beat enemies with a wrench. Um, it's so, it, it, hold on though, because it's, it's weird, isn't it? In what like way? they start you with a wrench, but the enemies that you're fighting, I wouldn't think are wrench. Wrench worthy. Like, they're a little wrench proof, aren't they? I don't know. I mean, kinda. Um, you can turn into a microscope and bust through a window. I saw. So yeah, later. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know if it all makes any sense at all. If that's an option, we'll see. hit shit it's, with a uh, wrench, turn into a microscope. Who knows? I'm getting. I get major system shock vibes from this game. Um, it's more system shock than Bioshock, but I mean... The big Bioshock really the comparison thing. is the fact that to get the upgrades, you take this uh, little gun-looking device and inject it into yourself. But the difference between this game and Bioshock is in Bioshock, you inject it into your wrist. And in this game, you inject it into your fucking eyeball. Oh, is, is that horrifying. why his eye gets redder every day when he wakes up? That must but, be it, because he's in, shooting this fucking shit right in there, dude. But in Bioshock, like, there's no skill system, really. Like you just have powers, and they just yeah. kind of like, get the you get the level upgrades up along gun. the way. But in this one, like you have to pick what you're gonna level up with your limited points, which is more akin to System Shock. Um, it's also Gmod's prop hunt single player, uh, because the mimics can just be anything. <laughs> oh, I'm right. serious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. mimics can just be anything, mm -hmm. and like you'll enter a room, and all of a sudden, like you'll see mimics for a second, and then all of a sudden, like. You, things jump up like because they all turned into something in the room to hide from you and you have to look for what's out of place you're like wait a minute that chair doesn't look like it looks like it should be there and you're like mm -hmm. whack and then it turns into a mimic you're like oh i got you you crazy why do mimic. they want to hide when they can eat you because they can sneak attack you mm -hmm. oh um yeah they, it's 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 good though so far i'm like two hours into the game uh i'm really interested as to what the hell's going on because the game Throws you for a loop within the first 40 minutes. Yeah, and I want to then... clarify. So the, the start of Prey, I think, is just the same as the start of the demo in that you start in your... I assume so. It's, you start in your apartment, right? Yes, okay, you start so in yeah, your apartment. Yeah, probably yeah, yeah. The yeah. Same. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I'm just uh, thinking but... of the original Prey. It's like a bit of a departure when it's like your Native American oh, grandfather get gets it's... abducted by an alien. <laughs> I want to get to that here in a second because yeah. I'm curious. Uh, other, other things that are really cool, though, is... Um, that you, there's a lot of different ways to go about your objectives. So if you're leveled up like your strength, basically, uh, you can like lift up heavy things to get into an area. It reminds you a little of like Deus Ex. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or you, or if you leveled up your hacking, then you can like hack into a computer, get the access codes, go into the IT room, do that. Uh, if you've leveled up like your repair skill or engineering, you could repair the robots to go fight for you and 
uh, clear the room and there's a lot of options, which I really, really like uh, mm -hmm. about the game. I don't understand why they called it Prey, which is, I was getting to that. <laughs> because I played, I played Prey 2006. I liked the game a lot. Yeah, me it too. It was silly. It was a little cheesy, but I, had, I enjoyed that game a great deal, and there were some really cool moments in it. I don't, I don't understand why this is called that Prey. That was back when you, you had a much easier time charging $60 for a game like Prey that nobody knew Right, about. exactly, in 06. <laughs> they went out of their way to call it a title that makes no actual sense so they can then sue somebody to change the title of their game where it could have made sense. I wonder if, like... <laughs> I do wonder if, like, <laughs> later down the line, they're going to connect it, like, to the old yeah, Prey or Yeah, right, something. like, you'd hope so. Because if they don't, there's just no need Nothing to, call to do this with it. Prey. Yeah. Like, the aliens are not the same. Well, they just decided that this would be a better game to call Prey than the previous <laughs> game they called Prey. That's literally does what it, happened. Does yes, it so have like, gravity switching shit in it? Because that was a big part of Prey as well. Not yet, but I'm still only a couple hours in. Like, there's, and, I already have a really funky gun called the glue gun. Yeah, that's which cool. Which you just, like, you, when you shoot it, it, like, will freeze up the mimics in place and, like, this glue case. You can, like, and, create platforms with it. You can, like, hold it and, yeah, you can create a Yeah, I expect range. there to be, like, wacky guns, so mm -hmm. maybe gravity. Can you turn into an eagle? Not yet. No, but you can turn into a cup, so. No, I want to be an eagle. It's <laughs> so free all the time. Just like, play Eagle the, Flight. I will give, oh, like, yeah. Prey, <laughs> the, Prey 2017, uh, the props of, like, making me paranoid because I will go into a room mm -hmm. and be freaking out that anything could be a mimic because if you get too close, it'll jump at you. Yeah. Um, and I like that. But there's also tells, which is great. Outside of things being out of place, if you listen closely, there's, like, a light clicking noise that the mimics make. So if you can hear it, then you can, like, you're like, all right, I'm near one. Now it I depends. Start looking what's you watch place. for the chain, and if the chain curves in, then they're a mimic, and if it <laughs> yeah, curves out, true, true, <laughs> very true. <laughs> I like the uh, I like the note about the attention to detail, though. Like when when you're going into a different room, you want to try to spot what is out of place, right? And they do yeah. that really early on too. Like even in the apartment, they they change things up a little bit, so you know it's like, oh shit, what's going on? Yeah, like something's off. Yeah, something's wrong. yeah, exactly. It's really cool the way they do that. Uh, it has it has done a good job of making me paranoid while I play it. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> later on, you get a, I don't know if it's, this is in the demo, but you come across a turret that you can pick up and bring with you. Mm -hmm. And I just like I've been carrying that thing has been with me for like forty <laughs> minutes. Been out like I, I go into a room, I'll put the turret down, I'll activate it, I'll wait for it to boot up, and I'm like, all right, now I'm safe, and I'll go into the room. <laughs> and then I'm like done, I'll pick it back. I'm like, come with me, turret. We're gonna go to the next room. <laughs> I've been told that I had the joke backward. About uh, the mimics. The other way around. My apologies to anyone uh, listening. Close enough. Close enough. Uh, it's gorgeous as well. It looks fantastic. I love the uh, the scenery and the. It's it's one of those games that you use a flashlight in it, but not every corridor is pitch black, which is fantastic. Like you can actually yep. see things around the corner usually. And <coughs> oh, last two. right, yeah, you know, certain <laughs> games. Oh, God. Not exactly the greatest at using actual lighting. They catched lighting. it, by the way. Have you have you finished Outlast two? I'm not gonna. I don't really okay. want to play it ever again. I'm almost. I, 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 I heard it gets it. worse after okay. the part I oh, stopped God. at. <laughs> Man, hang on. I want to. I don't Real know quick in the middle this. of my praise segment, let me throw the spoiler tags up. Let me hear about that last. But two. I don't want to talk to like. I just want the to talk quarry about part. The uh, is where I stopped. <laughs> the quarry part. Apparently, what? you go in a cave. I stopped right before There's the cave. A lot of caves happening, man. Well, I didn't go in them, <laughs> right. so there so, you go. Okay. The game got really weird in that it got less scary it wasn't scary to begin with i got you but like even less scary and more like what the fuck at the end because they have all this cool supernatural shit that we talked about last time but then they straight up are like uh this is basically directly connected to our last one Oh, and mm. everything that's happening in the town. I use this, are the spoilers up by yeah, the way? Yeah, spoiler warnings. Okay, up. Spoiler Nick, warnings do you up. care if I'm about to say all this? No, crap? Okay. I don't think I really want to play. So it you anymore. learn, you learn like through papers, like laid about that there are like trees that aren't actually trees. They're like tower, like radio towers disguised as trees. Well, and that's kind of spooky. The there's Project Wall Rider is basically happening not too far away. And the reason people are going all crazy and religious is because all the like radio waves from the Project Wall Rider are making everybody insane, including your character, which is why you keep having these flashbacks. And like the later you go into the game, the more like he can't discern past from present anymore, and he's gone nuts. Uh, and your wife has the baby, 
but the baby has no shadow and like your wife's like it's not real and like <laughs> it's, no shadow? yeah like it's it's a weird detail but it's there it's the worst birth defect i've ever seen <laughs> but like it's all like your ba- the baby isn't real she was like never pregnant and all this stuff isn't real and if people are talking about how like in outlast 1 they had to remove the women from the psych ward cuz project wall rider was giving them phantom pregnancies and like that's happening in outlast 2 it's it's all connected to outlast 1 wow and it, but it all gets connected to Outlast one like the last forty minutes. <laughs> like the wow, last dude. 40 all right, well, minutes. props for at least making it make sense then. Yeah. I as never would have known. As possible. Your your character basically loses it at the end. He just doesn't know what's real and what isn't anymore. And they leave it on like the biggest like what's happening cliffhanger. DLC but, cliffhanger or like Oh yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Back to back he, to prey. Yeah. So there you go. Back, <laughs> I was like, Nick, I need to Well thank you. Closure. Play. I needed that. Go. Now I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Prey, yeah, is good game. Yeah, play the Solid. demo if you have a console, because honestly, I think those first that first hour is really good. And if it doesn't hook you, then it's not for you. Yeah, don't don't watch anything. Just just do it. Just play. Is it? It's more of an action game, or is it more of like a action RPG? Yeah, atmospheric. No, like it's, even Bioshock it's... rides the line a little bit sometimes. It gets a little less mm. spooky when they give you your your gun finally. Yeah. Uh, in in Prey, oh, it's a but... finally gun kind of moment. You know, like the first yeah. hour and 15 minutes and then you're like, you know, you're freaking out because you only have a wrench mm-hmm. and a glue gun, which does no damage. And you come across some monsters that can destroy you. But once you have a gun, you're like, okay, I feel like right. I'm going to bend myself. Mm-hmm. Sounds cool. Seems, I'll probably play that. Seems pretty heavily action oriented from what I can see so yep. far. But it's like, it is a horror game though. There are some horror moments. I didn't really like feel scared. Paranoid. That's yeah, the only. Yeah, thing. it keeps scared, you on no. edge. It keeps you. It will jump scare you from time to time, but not much. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a horror uh-huh. game specifically. It's more. It's more okay. of an action RPG. So it rides atmosphere into an action moment thing. Like it, it yeah. transitions. Oh yeah, well, because once the monster's there, you're yeah. fighting. Yeah. It's like a Dead Space level of horror, I'd say. Where you're, you know. That seems like a bad comparison. I would actually, <laughs> honestly, I would bring it back to System Shock. System right. Shock was horror. Uh, but you could defend yourself. Dead Space is maybe the only game that's ever actually scared me. So oh, if, really? if oh, we're really? comparing okay, those, I'm like, not, I don't <laughs> get that comparison. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> more, more System Shock. Uh, it's it's actually really nice to have only have recently only played System Shock Two because it the comparisons are way more apt. Mm-hmm. System Shock Two and Prey are way more similar than Prey and Bioshock, in my opinion. And I'm still deep into Bioshock Infinite, so it'd be nice to get out of space racism land and get into someplace better. <laughs> That'd be a pretty natural segue, honestly, going from Infinite to this. You'd probably feel right at home. Well, I want to be at home. Mm-hmm. Right right at home and where it the runs, cups move. It runs way better on PC than Dishonored 2 did, which is really nice. That's well, good. they fixed it at least over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but that launch, this is working. It's a bad better. launch. It was. Cool. All right. Well, that's Prey. Sixty bucks available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. You can get it right now. Right now, you can buy that for sixty dollars. Can you a, believe it? There's a subscriber Sunday for you, Brian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, there's so many options for <laughs> subscriber Sunday. Hey, Ryan. You Until talk about, dawn. Uh, you want to talk about Tumble Seed? Tumble Seed is going to be the most slept on roguelite of 2007 mm-hmm. because he it. it. It is extremely well designed. It's a game designer's wet dream, and it's gorgeous, and the music is great. But I think I have a hunch that it might be sort of boring to watch. Hmm. And by sort of, you mean really, because I can't stand watching that game. Really? Tried. It bored the shit out of me. That is, I mean, I actually don't get it. There's just nothing visceral or appealing about it to me. It just doesn't. It just doesn't grab me, I guess. But it looks really looks, good. It looks real pretty. Let's talk about what it, it look, is. Yeah. Okay, Tumble Seed is a game in which you control uh, it's effectively a stick that pushes a round thing up a mountain. And by using your left analog stick and your right analog stick, you control both ends of the stick and you try to balance it, but also navigate it around holes that are in the map as you go up this mountain. But then additionally, you come across different power-ups that you can get, and you use the power-ups to roll over certain specific areas of the map, and then they give you abilities like having some spikes coming out of you or you know, shooting a big old rocket at enemies and stuff like that, generating more hearts for yourself, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. 
That's Tumbleseed. That's Tumbleseed for you. Yeah. So yeah, elaborate on that, Mathis. What, what's the? Uh, what's I, the I mean, it, the... it's hard to. I and honestly, <laughs> it's kind of hard to put into words. Like I've tried watching it a couple times. Uh, I watched your first video on it back what a couple months ago, Ryan. And I've watched your most recent one, um, just to see if like it's something that I, I would enjoy watching. Maybe I'll try playing it, but it's just it's just boring to watch. I don't know. I. Other than just saying it's, it's very, boring to watch, it's 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 slow paced, and it has it, to be slow paced because like when you're actually playing you. it, yeah, it's a uh, oh man, it's a whole nother beast, dude. Especially I was I was uh, at PAX West playing it on the custom tabletop controller that they had made for it, so I was using you know full fledged arcade joysticks to try to yeah, move things cool. up and down, which was a lot of fun too. But uh, playing it is really satisfying, especially when you're able to get to the point where you don't really have to think too much about what you're doing and you're instead just able to let your thumbs yes. sort of just manipulate mm -hmm. the board. You know, like Ryan was making the joke the other day, like he has become the board. And that, you know, you get to that point of this game where you're just sort of uh, unconsciously moving the, the sides in order to uh, accommodate for what's on screen. You start to just, instead of focusing on the left and right, you start to focus on what's coming up and ahead and what you can do. Uh, to move away from a certain obstacle and things like that. So it gets into the nuance of stuff. Also, really once you get past the first biome, like I, I actually accept that the first biome, pardon me, is a little boring because there's very few obstacles except holes. Yeah. And you find yourself a lot of the time just being like, go around the hole, go around the hole. However, once you get up to the second, third, and you know beyond biomes, it's actually like one of the hardest games I've played in recent memory. It, it is unbelievably difficult, uh, which in a way that actually like betrays the initial aesthetic that looks cartoony oh, and yeah. whimsical. Like, like You think you're going to have a sort of calming experience playing this game when you start it up, especially going through the first biome because you're like, oh yeah, it's kind of like that old arcade cabinet game where you could move the ball up through the holes and it's fun, but... Yeah, and then out of nowhere, the difficulty ramps up to a thousand. It's insane. It might just simply be like because I, I, there are games out there that play way better than they than they watch, and it just might be a, a case mm. of like it just doesn't translate to engaging viewing material. Isaac's engaging because there's always tension in a way that that maybe Tumbleseed can't present it, and that it's like quick high action rooms. Uh, crazy combinations of things that create very visually appealing effects. Tumble scene is pretty, but it's also kind of like a chill, like uh, yeah. relaxing kind of look. And uh, I, I totally understand how the game could be really great to play. Just like Ryan said, watching it might just be a different experience. It's it's hard to explain it. I don't want to like bite like the hand. Like Invisigun Heroes, like chat said. Invisigun. Yeah, but oh, this yeah. is like a lot better than Invisigun Heroes. So, Great, like, but like it's one of those games that people like but don't like watching. Yeah, but like I think I I accept that, and I, I knew this not necessarily before the game came out, but the day the game came out and I played it on Switch and there were six people on the leaderboards, I was like, oh, this is going to be my Shenzhen IO for 2017. <laughs> it's going to be the game that I am going to champion like a hipster because i think it's full of clever design decisions but for whatever reason it doesn't resonate with as many people as i think it should but what i will say at the risk of biting the hand that feeds is that i find it a lot more engaging of an approach to the roguelite formula than flint hook i think flint hook has right. a, yeah. it has a lot of good stuff going for it it's also a gorgeous game but you know, I find the dynamicness of trying to navigate the levels in Tumbleseed and manage the resources there a lot more engaging than like, hey, there's a dude in the center of the screen that shoots bullets in like eight directions. And then when you kill him, there's like two dudes that fire bullets in one direction. And then when you kill him, there's a couple of starfish that spin around over yeah. and over and over. They can both like be good. <laughs> why does why one have to be bad? To the, 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 reason I'm, the reason I'm drawing the comparison is because I'm like alternating them in videos. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, like in the same time slot. And I think that the Flint hook videos are a lot easier to watch and understand what's going on. And the element of control that the person playing it actually has. Like I, I think actually you watch say, someone like, they have this opposite problems. I think when you watch someone play Flint Hook, you're like, I see what they're doing right and I see what they're doing wrong. Whereas when you watch Tumbleseed, it's a little harder to get that language across. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not it, like I even remember the first time I was playing Tumble Seed, I had a little bit of difficulty actually parsing out what all the individual elements are, you know, and I think they even adjusted the uh, the UI a bit to help you to identify like when the drop points are coming, for example, when the areas where you can go access new items are showing up because those are a little difficult to actually see uh, a while back. And then, you know, like they, it's also it's surprisingly deep like you mentioned like there's actually a lot of strategy involved with it with uh using your different seeds at the right time and making sure that you've got the right stuff uh or that you're choosing the right stuff for the level like it's it's cool the way that so few um mechanics are able to be so varied it it really does have a surprising degree of strategy and that's not just to like toot its own horn but it it's a game that sort of like reveals itself the more you play. Yeah. And I made I made the comparison actually, and it might people are gonna roll their eyes, but I kind of felt like it was like Rocket League at first. Where literally when when I first played the game at PAX West, it was actually like if you come across a bridge, you can't do it. I can't get across this bridge because <laughs> the first few times you play, you're just going like back and forth mm-hmm. up the mountain because you don't really understand how to control it super well. So right. coming across a bridge is the final boss. Now, steadying yourself and going straight up is super easy. And like that's like with Rocket League, you're like, at first you're like, how am I going to get my car to hit this soccer ball? But eventually after like 10 hours, you're like, I can do anything yeah. in this game. And now it's about like outsmarting the other people. So uh, once you get that initial like feel for the controls down, it really opens up. And I've been rolling like a pacifist strategy that apparently is actually garbage. Apparently aggression is the right way to play. But I also like that unlike Isaac Dailies, and they've got to approach it from different angles for a number of reasons. However, unlike Isaac Dailies, your score is the height that you got up the mountain. It's mm-hmm. not an abstract composite of how did you get there? How yeah. long did it take you? How many items did you pick up along the way? But instead, it's like no matter which way you play, the only thing that matters is getting as far up that mountain as you can. So I think it handles score in a good way as well. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just fun to play. Too. It's, an, it's a fun new idea that is executed really well, which you just, I mean, you got to give kudos to that where you see it, especially in an indie release. But this is, it's a new concept that works really well with the amount of uh, things they put in place to allow it to function properly. And it, it's really satisfying when you start to really get into it. So... Same recommendation over here, Tumble Seed. It's good stuff. I think, like, there are a couple of things I'll say about Tumble Seed. I do think that I don't know if it's too expensive, but I think it has the perception of being too expensive, which uh, I will say. 15. When I paid, I mean, I paid 22 Canadian dollars for it on Switch, and I was happy to do it because I already knew that it was good, but I can understand that it, it also may have a problem where watching it is not that entertaining, and then you go, oh, maybe I'll give it a try, and you're like, that's $22. Like, I can understand that. And also the fact that it has a minimalist style to it, for better or worse, makes people think that it is like a cell phone game. Like people think that this should be like a $3 game on cell phone or something like that. But that's really just down to, I I think it does a good job of encapsulating the things that actually make it a much more robust game than that. But unfortunately, it it works against it from a marketing standpoint. No, I mean, that does sell it, sure. And I'm sure you're aware of that. Banging, I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. Like, you know, it, it it really is just the thumbsticks and the A button, but that's is a uh, an extremely simplified version of what this actually has to offer. Uh, but yeah, I don't have I don't have much to harp on it for. Really, I'm I've been pretty satisfied. And there we go, tumble scene. I I genuinely think that this will be one of those games that like is on my top ten. It, I mean, it's for honor all over again. To some extent, where I'm like, Look, come on, guys. It's, like, actually really good, and you're not giving it a chance to blossom. And I, I think, you know, it, it hits me right in, in my wheelhouse, or in my wheelhouse for whatever reason. Like, sure. it actually, uh, it, I, it's a game that I could really, it, you know, the, the, the way that people talked about Downwell, where they were like, Downwell is the smartest game I've ever played. And I played it, and I was like, it's fun, but I don't really get it. That. Tumble Seed is my downwell, where when I play it, I'm like, this is genius, and nobody understands how good it is. <laughs> and I understand why, but still. I don't know, man. I don't, 
I don't think I dislike it, but I don't think I'm nearly as enthusiastic about it as you are, and I'm not really sure why what, yet. Yeah, what turns you off to it? The, just I, well, I think see. the difficulty curve right off the bat is too hard. Uh, and I don't mean that as a negative necessarily, but it's too hard for me. Mm. Um, the loop is such that you will play sometimes for 10 seconds before you lose. If you're doing really badly, obviously, it's not every time it's random. Mm -hmm. But uh, that loop, combined with the face that this is the entire game, like there aren't really other modes, what you do is you go up the mountain and you rotate. Yeah. And if you're not feeling that right away, that's all you've got. Yeah. That's it. That's fair. It's not like we're in any other platform where you can just kind of go somewhere else and do something else, try a different angle on things. Yeah, there's strategy to it for sure. I'm not saying there isn't. But if you get a bad draw, you get some bad randomization, it's just that runs over basically. But the same could be said of any procedural um, game. So it's not on. intrinsically that game's fault. That's where I'm kind of like, because I love Isaac. And I don't want people to think that I don't because I say this. But like when you walk into a room in Isaac, it's kind of the same as a tumble seat encounter, except you're just also shooting. You have like, much less autonomy to start though. Whereas with a platformer or Isaac, you can control your character directly. If you're not feeling the physics of rotating back and forth, you're kind of like, you're either going to learn it or you're not. And I think that's going to be a line in the sand for some people where they go, I just don't care. Like, this is too annoying. I don't want to put up with this. I do agree with that. But I guess I, I've kind of, I don't find the movement that abstract anymore, I guess. Right. I, which, and maybe that's because I, I invested a lot of time. How more you seem like you got it right away. Like you were into it how immediately. Long, how long would you say it took you to be like comfortable with it? Well, and maybe like under an hour. Yeah. But there are still times where I'm like, where it doesn't do what I want it to do. Like there are times when I, I'm like, avoid that hole. And then I fall in the hole. Yeah. And I go, well, you know. Womp womp. Like, I certainly don't dislike it. I just, I can't really get that excited for it either. Like I'll play it more, but I don't think I'm looking forward to playing it nearly the way I did with Isaac. Mm -hmm. It's just like, uh, you know, it's fine. I'll, I'll try it, whatever. <laughs> However, with Flint Hook, I was like, I can't wait to play more of this. This is really good. I like the movement of this. Although I grant you, you were right. Some of the rooms are total bullshit. Some but. of the rooms are just <laughs> you get that in every bullshit. game. <laughs> no, I, I think that Flint Hook has a particularly egregious position here. Like the Flint the, Hook the, has some a lot of, the, of problems. Some of the rooms in that game are just they're straight out of a fucking fan game. It's insane. There, I mean, if we're if we're gonna pivot a little bit to Flint Hook, yeah. What what I said in the Skype chat holds true for me, which is that. I really think that Flint Hook is a good game, but it could be a great game if they didn't design it sort of as like a raid-based roguelite system. Like it's like well, almost. I like that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I I like it on like an intellectual level, but yeah. I'm like the conceptually, it's a little. Yeah, well, I, I I do like the fact that it's like thirty minutes long per run. It's got like that lunch break roguelite and I, I even hesitate to call it roguelite because i don't think that's yeah. what it's going for but i think that the flint hook mechanic in an action 2d side scroller would be really cool but it suffers in my opinion because some of the rooms are not well designed for the platforming mechanic of the hook right. some of the rooms are just too hard for the finicky hook mechanics like the one where yeah, you I drop agree. down and there's the spike balls so dropping down is really easy, but then on the way up, you have to land yeah, like... Yeah, yeah, that one in particular. Well, I had to deal with that no. one today. Yeah, that was just... It's insane to try to assume the trajectory before you're even able to know where you're going to hook to. The, the problem is the proportions of the collision, right? I think the game needs to tone the, the size of the player down by about 30% in some cases. If you had a much smaller hitbox, I mean, a lot of those problems, you'd be you'd be able to have a slight longer... Uh, amount of reaction time to be able to deal with them. Yeah. In this yeah. case, you basically just shoot yourself directly into spikes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. And I, I get that Flint Hook is more like Rogue Legacy. I actually feel like Rogue Legacy works great, but I feel like Flint Hook has a lot of the same problems I had with Rogue Legacy, which is that it's uh, it's almost underdesigned in a way. And I don't mean it necessarily that that's always a bad thing, but I feel like if you designed a game around that hook mechanic it would be really good. But if you sort of go, we're going to apply the roguelite formula to some extent, at least, 
And then we're going to throw like a little hook gimmick into it. It, it sells itself short in some situations. The same way, like in, in Rogue Legacy, there were times there's like a skeleton. And then the way you kill the skeleton is standing next to it. And there's like a wall and you just press X and just smack <laughs> it like six times. And that, that part is not that enjoyable. Like, and <laughs> well, I, I find that in, in Flint Hook as well. Like in Flint Hook, when you, uh, and I will tie this back to Tumble Seed in just a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good segue. But in Flint Hook, when the dude spawns in the middle and he shoots out bullets in six directions, and you just stand sort of akimbo to him and then shoot up diagonally from the way that he can't hit you, I don't really find that fun. I'm like, It's I also- a misattribution of the character design, though, in that case, because it's meant to be taken with other characters that force you to move. You know, it's like, it's like there's a, a monster in Isaac that chases you, but there's nothing else to mess you up. Right, so yeah. you'll win every time. I, uh, mm-hmm. So that's not really the game's fault. It's just bad generation. Well, yeah, and that might be kind of the core of the issue is i wonder how much of it is procedural and how much of it is set to certain rooms you know like i wonder if they intentionally are throwing that six shooter in there with a with the monster that is supposed to you know make that more difficult or if it's just sort of randomly populating stuff i I also balance issues issues, yeah Yeah. i i like flint hook i don't love flint hook but i like flint hook yeah i am amazed that for all the times people, and this is my own personal grudge because I'm catching more flack over uh, Tumble Seed than I am over Flint Hook, and I kind of have the reversed opinion of those games. I am amazed I have not heard anybody complain to me that, like, hey, you ever notice Flint Hook only has like eight enemies? There's only like eight enemies in that whole game. I kind of just disguise it, it more really well the... if that's the case. I don't. I don't think that's the <laughs> case. Like, there's like, uh, I can think of like ten, but. I, I I assumed that in the later Wonder. ships there would be quite a few more, but I don't know. Maybe well, I mean, I'm case. I'm on the third boss. I'm on the third boss too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's. I mean, like they introduce a couple more in the new ships, but half the enemies are are environmental though, so I don't really hold that against it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, back to Tumbleseed. There. So the difference for me is that Tumbleseed may actually be worse on a conceptual level. I can understand that completely, but. I think I've, and I've said many times on the show, I am so mechanics driven that almost nothing else matters to me. And the fact that there's never a time in Tumble Seed where you're really absent the mechanics of the game, I guess, is what makes it more engaging for me. Mm-hmm. Where in Flint Hook, yeah. if there's one enemy on the screen that shoots a bullet straight at you, you got him. Like, <laughs> You got no problems. Yeah. Whereas if in Tumble Seed, if there's a couple of holes in front of you, you still do have to. I guess pay attention. Tumble but, Seed keeps you constantly engaged. That, that's where I'm coming from, I yeah. think, to some extent. And I find myself, I do get frustrated playing Tumble Seed. Like, and I, I take that to some extent as a negative. I do think it's a little bit too hard, especially early on. However, it is, um, I don't know. I guess it's, I find it less boring. Like, I'm never bored when I play Tumble Seed. There are times when I don't want to play it, but it's because I just had, like, a 15-minute run where I lost 2 HP. You got to plant a fucking flag. I get hit by an enemy, and then I get launched into the air, and then when I land, I land directly in a hole, and I'm, <laughs> I'm dead, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. No, I, I did my research, by the way. Oh, what's up? 48 enemies in Flint Hook, but... How, how many of them are purple versions of green versions <laughs> of if you if you remove the reskins you're down to about 15 yeah all right that sounds about right yeah a lot of reskins of mm. like different kinds again I, i'm not shitting on flint hook at all i think yeah. flint hook is a good game that does a good job of disguising the fact that it's actually pretty short but i uh i i as long as we're talking about flint hook I think the mechanics of that would work better in a side-scrolling action game. Just me personally. Yeah, my biases say the opposite. I I would love the Rogue Legacy idea, uh, and I, I'm not tired of it. I wish there were more of them. And I think probably what is getting me here is that I'm so autonomy-driven when it comes to gameplay. Mm-hmm. The ability to directly control my character, I guess, counts for more points in my own mind, uh, and it makes me feel more fulfilled that I can do exactly what I'm trying to do. And Flint Hook is especially high in the autonomy scale. Like, you have really good movement. Whereas, you know, look at the alternative. Yeah, I mean, we're dealing seed, with you're the, the entire premise of the game is try and control this thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that's where I'm put off by it. And that's not the game's fault. Maybe it's a mismatch for me. Sure. But yeah. I still like it somewhat. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. I also, I just want to point out, I resent the notion from 
couple specific people in chat that I'm defending a game that I have a backlog for. Not to be – people are going to watch the videos anyway. That's a bit petty. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, the, I, I don't even have a big backlog for it, for one, because I was kind of waiting to see how people took it. But there's going to be enough people that watch the videos, especially for, like, the first ten of them, that that doesn't matter yeah. to me. I actually think that Tumble Seed is a great game that is probably being slept on because, as Matt has said, it looks boring. Even, like, I got – not to brag, but I got recognized out yesterday. And the guy that I was talking to who recognized me was, like, Flint Hook – is awesome, but I don't really get Tumble Seed. And I was like, I can totally understand that. Mm-hmm. Like, Tumble Seed is a game that mm-hmm. might be boring as sin to watch. But Somebody I... called out, like, what about Snake Pass? And I'm like, that's a good question. Because that didn't bother me. And that game is exactly the same as Tumble Seed in it's that you're not, struggling to control uh, a character. You, have, you still have more control over the snake. Yeah, oh, because I know why. It's because there's no fail condition directly. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's what it is. And you're also like, it is the struggle to actually get the snake to go where you want, but you are moving the snake. You're not. And like, you're, yeah, if you mess up, it's like you don't just lose the game and start from the beginning. You mm-hmm. just try again. Yeah. And so, okay, good call on, on the question Tumble and seed, about snake pass. Yeah, Tumble Seed is hardcore. I mean, like, it's it's not easy. And we, we mentioned that a little while ago in that you get a little deceived. You see this kind of pleasant, minimalist game that might look like it's just sort of a relaxing 20 uh, minute lunch break game but no this is it's a hardcore roguelite it's only for mm-hmm. hardcore gamers that's right that's i actually right. think like spelunky is a really good analog not in terms of its mechanics but in terms of like the average length of a run okay like i maybe I even think progression I'm, wise too i'm i'm probably in like the top third of tumble seed players which i don't think is anything to brag about but my average run is like eight to ten minutes long yeah. which is probably Dang. about it about how long my average Spelunky run was until I like <laughs> ascended, yeah. like Brody quested to the <laughs> I part broke where you through the code. <laughs> yeah. God, I'm finding that man, every every new roguelite I pick up now, I'm realizing a lot of them have that same sort of ceiling and they don't really translate well one to the other. Like I keep thinking to myself, oh, I put like four hundred or five hundred hours in Spelunky now. I should be able to take that and apply it to all these new roguelites mm-hmm. I'm playing. And uh it's no, it's it, yeah. every single one you've got to put in the time to be You're able in to the business fishing. of making it new every time that yeah. you can't really transfer those skills. Mm-hmm. I thought with Flint Hook especially I'd be I'd be a lot more adept at it than I am, but I also mm-hmm. went from controller to uh, keyboard and mouse with Flint Hook. Keyboard so is the way. Yeah. Is, yeah. I still yeah. stand by my initial critique of Flint Hook in that both ways of controlling it are acceptable, but none feel phenomenal. No, but the controller is so much worse. I this is the biggest transition from like I see the light for Why? me ever. <laughs> <laughs> Why does the right <laughs> stick not independently control? I, yeah, I mean, that, that is a pretty big oversight. It's, it's so dumb. Yeah. Like, I will stand by using whatever control method you want, except in Flint Hook, where it actually... <laughs> there's, there's situations where there will be a, a shielded enemy with a bubble that you have to hook to get rid of, and there will be a hook on either side of it. You can't consistently get it on controller. Yeah. So the, unless I'm, like so bad at the game that i don't even Mm. understand but the aiming is tied to the left stick and it's dependent on where you're actually standing which seems crazy to me when obviously on mouse and keyboard it just doesn't work that way it could be still being worked on maybe they didn't get it tweaked exactly right but i would recommend starting with keyboard see if you like that better whereas i'm usually the opposite when it comes to platformers oh they Um, just patched it okay Oh, mm-hmm. they cool. patched yeah. it to what? What did they change? Oh, can you use the? They right were listening to the show. They literally just <laughs> patched it. Yeah, just now they hit the button. Yeah, <laughs> thank God. I want to. This is only tangentially related, but I want to shame myself because I, I uh, ran into that enemy for the first time in uh, Flint Hook today. That's that dog with a spinning flail around it that goes super fast. Yeah, yep, yep. yep. I had no idea what the fuck to do. I could My, not figure it out. I was just I shooting at the to, damn thing the whole time. I've seen it. I saw I saw that thing once in Ryan's video. My thought was, are you supposed to slow down time? You're supposed to slow down time. I could not okay. fucking figure it out for the you life You only of have, like, two options. I know. You either hook something or you slow down so time. Much. Especially <laughs> after the fact when I realized that's what I was supposed to do. I was, oh, God. I felt yeah. like a 
fucking idiot, but <laughs> of course I also saw it uh, in my first video ever. Oh, so, your yeah, your mm-hmm. reaction was great. Maybe I jump on its head. And I'm like, hmm, I can I work. fucking walked in. I was sure the game had broken or something. I had no idea what the fuck I was supposed to do. He's the final boss, man. Yeah, exactly. Were you not ready? He was the only enemy left in the room, and I was like, is it glitched? What am I doing? Uh, anyway, there we go. Tumble seed. That's what we're talking about. It's on Steam. It's 15 bucks. I like it. I like it. I think it's a lot of fun. Unique experience. I think it's worth a go. Get ready. The, like, and I recognize that I'm in this camp. This is going to be the hipster game for at least this season where, you know, in a year from now, people are going to be like, it was so slept on. Yeah. Why do but, I never get to declare hipster games? Well, what's you, what's your it? game of the month, Nick? Oh, that's know. true. We do have to talk about that. <laughs> I don't know what my game of the month is. I well, let's it determine out. it right now. It's time for the April game of the month discussion, ladies and gentlemen. We are doing every single month here on Roundtable. A new initiative for 2017. We've done our January, February, and April. January, February, March games of the month so far. Going into April, uh, I've, got, I've got a couple of legit top-of-the-line contenders in my mind, but I want to hear from y'all first. What do you got? Nick? Don't pick me first. I'm the one that th- knows the least, I think. <laughs> right. I have a gut reaction, but I don't know that I want to necessarily stand by it. Anybody that uh, feels think, confident, feel free to speak I, up. I just looked at the list of games and uh, of the ones I've played here. Yeah. I, it's going to be tough for me because I don't know if it's going to – it's one of the two. I really – I know people are torn on this game, but I really enjoyed Ukulele. I think oh, ukulele was ooh, bold choice. Mm-hmm. was really good. I, I got exactly what I expected out of the game. I know that a lot of the reviews will be like, it's stuck in a bygone, I'm like that a bygone era. Yeah, that's what I was, I kind of wanted Banjo 3, and no, that's yeah. what I got. Um, and then my other game that I'm kind of teetering on is uh, Little Nightmares. Yeah, dude, yeah. Little I Nightmares. I I, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you, you play Little <laughs> Nightmares, obviously, Bear. I beat Little Nightmares. No spoilers. The only reason it's not, I'm not going to spoil anything. The only reason it's not taking away you lately is because the last 20 minutes of that game threw me off. Really? I, hmm. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that maybe one time, but um, sure. it, it it threw me for a loop in not such a good way. I was really it, satisfied I, with it. I'm surprised I, to hear that. I was satisfied, but like I felt like it stepped away from what it was, what I thought it was trying to tell of a story, mm. and then just went in a totally different direction. I can see that actually. Yeah, I can understand that. But ukulele, I think, is going to take it for me. Mm-hmm. That is, yeah, that's a really surprising choice. Actually, we may very well have four entirely different uh, selections for April. That's like that's exciting. Uh, Ryan, you ready? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. Tumble it's good. It, yeah, it's good <laughs> that we talked about both of these games. But I think for me, I didn't play a ton in April, and it comes down to Flint Hook versus Tumble Seed, and I definitely see myself playing more tumble seed than flint hook so i would give it that's a may release though that's uh technically oh you're right (laughs) that actually is may 1st but i don't feel like i want to give it to flint you know and it's not just out of (laughs) petty i refuse (laughs) smash his face into the mud because like i think flint hook is good but i don't think it's that good when did battlegrounds come out march yeah Yeah. i mean that was already like my game of the month for march i would i would i would definitely rather give it to uh flint hook than battlegrounds for the second month in a row i think that is bordering on like caricature but i don't know i mean i guess i I don't want to say by default but yeah I guess I guess I'll give it to Flint Hook with the caveat that I didn't play the sexy brutal and I didn't yeah. play um, what remains of Eden Finch or sorry Edith, Edith. Finch yeah. Edith Finch uh, and I didn't play Outlast too and I probably never will but don't. and I didn't play Little probably Nightmares. don't honestly yeah, don't. Yeah. you should play Little Nightmares though oh you should, should play, play Little Nightmares, Nightmares for sure it's like I beat it in like two hours yeah it won't take you long Nick. Mm. So I was kind of tossing it up between Flint Hook and everything. Yeah. The PC. Because everything came out on PC, mm-hmm. and I suppose that will let that be a thing, that if it comes out on a new platform, it just came out again. Yeah. <laughs> Fine with me. And I don't know. I think if I would have played Little Nightmares, I probably would have picked that over either of them. 
I think you would have. Which too. is not actually a detriment to either of them either. It's it's just a compliment for a game I haven't played. <laughs> <laughs> I really like everything. It gets really, really. This seems really redundant to say, but really odd towards the end. <laughs> that does say, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for I just really t- what a non-statement that is. <laughs> it gets odder than it is, right? It goes to a place that I didn't think this game was trying to make a statement about. Mm. That is which interesting. I don't know which if it's about throws Microsoft me. being the next Netflix yeah, creator yeah, for video games. Go. That's where it goes. I, I honestly still don't know what I think about what happened when I f- finished everything. Huh. Maybe I never will understand that feeling. Uh, and for those reasons, Flint Hook is a much more tempting idea because I understand that it is a video game that can be started and ended mm. um, and does not conceptualize every idea and thought of everything that exists in the universe. <laughs> Which is not exactly... So you see my conundrum? It's not yeah. an easy decision. <laughs> that's tough. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to... I'm not going to say that's tough. Uh... Uh, flip a coin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving it to Flint Hook. All right. Sorry, everything. Takes away our everybody with a different choice dream. Yeah, I sorry. Guess, but yeah, but like, but, but. yours is a, yours is Flint Hook with an asterisk. So he I wanted suppose... to not give it to Flint Hook as hard as he could. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should recuse myself because I was like, I was away for. Yeah, you you were gone. But for that's not person. really sensible. And mine has an asterisk because I'd rather have given it to Little Nightmares. So, so as long as Flint Hook does not get recognized in any way as being good, <laughs> the podcast yeah. will be yeah, happy. Pretty dang good game. Flint Hook came out during a month where it didn't have that much competition. It's not like well, I it like did. you or anything. It didn't earn it. It had competition. Y'all just didn't play any of the games. That's true. No, I like Flint Hook. It, it deserves the, the month. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, I'm not going to give it to Flint Hook, even though I also enjoyed Flint Hook uh, and still enjoy Flint Hook. Not as much as I thought I would, but I still do enjoy it. Uh, Little Nightmares is absolutely a front runner for me. Little Nightmares is fucking wonderful. I'd love to take another opportunity to say that. It is great, and I really think y'all should play it. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with a surprise pick here for my game of the month. Persona 5. Uh- Okay, I was just going to guess that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a good choice. Because holy shit, I've been playing more of it this week. I'm up to like, I think, 20-ish hours. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I've been I've been going some late nights with this Has one. Has it super hooked you now? It's got me pretty fucking deep, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm That's really awesome. into the story, surprisingly. I did not expect that at all, but I, I'm really enjoying finding mm. out what's going on and learning more about these characters. And, like, it's it's... You know, I, this probably isn't surprising, but it's playing out like a really good anime to me. It's really, it's really cool that Yo, it's. Oh, I've been watching anime again. Yeah, dude. Good shit. And I'm watching the dumbest thing. Oh, you're watching. Uh, I, I can't remember. Hold on. The the name of this one. Uh, <laughs> no, you're gonna have to say it's it. It's great. Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. There you go. Yeah, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. It's so what? good, though. That's the anime. <laughs> what? You're watching, man. I'm also gonna say what. <laughs> Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Miss Kobayashi's slight... Dragon Maid. It's like a slice of life comedy. Oh, so good. Yeah. But he's a slice of life. That's like the, the genre. Of Yashi's into- Dragon Maid. <laughs> Just a slice of life. I've been watching Little Witch Academia. That's a really good anime as well. Chat is with it's me. Basically Chat anime is Harry Potter. with me. Good. Thank you. This is the only time this has ever happened, yep. and it will be the only time it ever happens. In about again. five seconds, they'll revert to fuck Mathis. So just enjoy right, it while it's fine. Lasts, yeah. I will, I'm, I'm going to bask in this one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I I really like Persona 5, and it's got me back in those old JRPG days when I was a kid, when I would play these games and yeah. get super involved with the characters and stuff, and I, I'm really well shocked written. by it. I really am. I did not expect to like it, but I've I've thoroughly enjoyed my time. So Persona 5, that's definitely mm-hmm. my answer. I intend to play it, just haven't yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved four, and I this is it's too uh, it's too explosive right now. I need to let it settle down sure. a little, and I'll probably play it over the summer. Yeah. You got to wait until Atlas isn't looking for people to ban. Yeah, that exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. So, yeah, that's that's mine. So, we got Persona 5, a couple of flint hooks with caveats, and uh... <laughs> you're going to remind me. Sorry. I totally forgot, Mathis. Which one did you choose? Ukulele. Ukulele, okay. that's right. Yeah, the surprise pick as well. Cool. Well, there we go. Game of the month for April of 2017. Right. My shelf is fine, Chad. Chill out. 
Really? It's not fine, it's a little though. Bit shoveled it's back fine. There. I'm going to Sharpie it later tonight. <laughs> oh, okay. Then then it's fine. Let's bring us out into everybody's <laughs> favorite segment. It's Ask Roundtable. <clears throat> Ask Roundtable, the weekly segment where you send your questions to roundtableyt at gmail.com. And we do our best to answer them. This week's question comes from Carl. Carl! 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 With Skyrim coming out for the Nintendo Switch later this year, I was wondering, what Boy. games in the past few years do you think we will still be playing for years to come? He's also requested a Nick's Weird Games theme song in the form of the American National Anthem. <laughs> Yep. Cable? All right. You got it. That's delightful. <laughs> For years to come. With Skyrim coming out on the Switch later this year in its eighth iteration, what games do you think, made in the last few years, will, will be standing the test of time? What do you guys think you'll be playing in 2023? Hollow Knight. You think so? Yeah, it's going to be my new Super Metroid. I'll probably be playing it once every couple of years again. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm kind of with you there, honestly. Hollow Knight was uh, was remarkably good. With the yeah. DLC and with the new areas, like I'm I'm excited to play it again right now. It is just better finished than it. Flint Hook. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it that. Why do these devs deserve such this abuse? Such a weird position we're taking on that game with this show, man. I don't know it's if it's good. good or bad. It's not a pretty, bad game. <laughs> we, we, we're just taking the position of fuck this pretty damn good game. Yeah, it really. is. Well, it's good. It is good. Uh, this is a, I think we've kind of actually, uh, addressed this question earlier in the show with the, uh, the big three, you know, you got Rocket League, Hearthstone, Player Unknowns, Battlegrounds. So those things, w which one of those three would you say, we already said which one the server is going to be shut down for first. Which one of those three do you th still think is going to be like maintaining the same player base in like five years? <laughs> Rocket League. I'd say yeah, so too. Rocket League. Mm -hmm. None of them. I think Dota and League will be around for years to come yeah. still. I think those uh, are yeah, like CS:GO is probably not going to go anywhere. Maybe it'll be <laughs> player unknown battlegrounds, but uh, eventually I think we're going to have a uh, a battlefield game that just hits every nail. I think Terraria will get its eight hundred thousandth uh, content patch in twenty sixty five. God, long after Terraria two, three, one? and four. <laughs> did it, I did believe Terraria they've, just get another one? I believe they've canceled other world or they whatever did. the other. Right, so like yeah. that's, but that wasn't really officially a Terraria game. It was like a tower defense sort of extrapolation in the Terraria universe. But Terraria Two was also still to be a thing and may still exist. But yes, there has been a recent content patch, and it was a merge with a another game, and I don't think it looked very good. I don't know what it was exactly. Now I want to play Terraria again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still saying an NLSS game. Speaking of which, yeah. I think that my archetypical candidate for something like this is tycoon slash sandbox games yeah. along the lines of RimWorld and Astroneer and Factorio. Mm -hmm. I think that those have a conceivable niche. I, I'd even, I haven't played it in like four years, but I'd throw like Kerbal Space Program in there as That's well. I think like stuff where you always have the ability to optimize your own gameplay style and the art of it is completely timeless because in those games, it's already bad. So, so it's not Fortress like... Exactly. We'll be around for another 30 years. They've planned on passing on the code after the developers die so it can continue development. Yo, the next update, like, everyone... They did like, that now! <laughs> once a year, I fall into this Dwarf Fortress hole, and uh, it usually comes around the time where they've announced their new big update and stuff. And their new one that's coming out has to do with, like, bringing magic into the game, and, like, the way of... The, the way he's going about doing it, it just... It's mind... It's mind-boggling. Mm. And, like, how... What how deep... Mean? Dwarf Fortress goes. I have to read the article again because like, why is it mind-boggling? Is <laughs> because it, of the way. All right, let me bring <laughs> it up. Let me bring it up. Dwarf Fortress Magic, that's coming out. Talks about simulating the most, uh, the most complex magic system ever. All right, I'm going to look through this article and find like the quote, a good quote for you, and how he's going to do it. Okay, boggle my mind. Yeah, Get back. I'm going to try. You need to be mind-boggled. All right, well, I'll do. Carl. Not Skyrim is a, my answer. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> not, fair to, answer. not to offend people, but 
I don't really want to play that game Certainly again. Certainly not fucking Flint Hook, that's for damn sure. <laughs> God damn it, dude. <laughs> Thanks. You gotta remind me, I gotta play that pretty good game after the show. <laughs> don't Fuck. remind me, dude. Uh, thank you, Carl, for the question. If you've got a question, hey, we could use them because we're running low. Feel free to send it over to roundtableyt at gmail.com. There's the uh, link right there for you. That'll bring us into everybody's favorite segment after their favorite segment. It's Nick's Weird Game. Okay, you got to give me a second because it's like, oh, say can. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm, yep. But then the note that comes at the end of the song, if I start in that octave, is tidy. Yeah. So I've got to do like an, a pitch shift downwards yep. when I get to the. Okay, so like sure. this is why I can't sing. But anyway. <laughs> Drop D. Yeah. Also, I don't know off, the, off my heart the American National Anthem, but I think. This is roughly the structure. Give me your interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Wow, this is, I got it. Oh, it's time for weird games <laughs> from the shelf of our Nick from an era long gone. <laughs> it's a turd since forgotten. Whose bad names and controls? Made us Mathis, all motion salute. sick. All oh, right. Got a lukewarm thumbs down. So the devs were downtrodden. It's a four out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not too kid then. <laughs> Though I hear that's all right. It is not a weird game. <laughs> Don't play this Nick's weird game. It's not worth your time. <laughs> hey, that was good. <laughs> For the PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> From 2009. Woo! Woo! Thank, you. Thank you. This is where you know you, the camera pans over to the audience. You got somebody crying. Yeah. Yep. That was a roller coaster. <laughs> that was beautiful. I went to put my hand over my heart, and I saw which direction you did it, and I copied without thinking which side of my chest my heart was on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, they're doing this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I tried to match you. Oh, Big for games. Right. Uh, closer chats. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> okay, you all ready for this? Y'all ready for this? You're not going to get it, but here yeah, we go. That's what I hear. Uh, today's game is on the PS1. Of course. It is developed by a developer called Alpha System. A-L-F-A. Oh, man. Like throwing, alfalfa. Throwing us for a loop. Okay. Uh, we're talking a release in North America of 1998. Oh, Jesus. And it's a light gun shooter with both single <laughs> and multiplayer. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, 98 I'll even light give you gun this shooter one. on the PS1? <laughs> I'll give you this one. If you've ever seen the game, you might actually get it based on this info. Okay. Uh, it is a two-disc case. With one disc inside, they use the entire second half for a, an instruction booklet. Oh, Are God. you serious? <laughs> it's not even very big. Do I don't you know have what it? they're doing. Yeah, I got oh, it. Oh, that's amazing. It's sitting right over there. I'm gonna show it to you mm -hmm. after you don't guess it. Mm -hmm. It's no way. It's any of like the normal stuff. Yeah, like, you gotta say like it's silent not scope, time it's, crisis. It's Japanese nonsense game. All right. So yeah. figure it out based on that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, so like boobs, girls. Is oh, there's in... boobs. There's boobs and girls on the cover. All right, all right. Yes. Is it Radiant yes. Silver Gun? No, but that does have gun in the title, so that's, that's not a bad guess. Listen, you've already beaten me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I never played so, any light gun games at home. This game was critically very well received. Oh, um, it has a science fantasy setting. Which is, okay. they add the little opinion of which is uncommon in light gun shooters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Along with its incorporation of RPG elements, and particularly the artistry of its presentation, features an orchestral soundtrack and animated cutscenes directed by the anime director Rintaro. So if, you know, Rintaro if you're a big Rintaro time. fan, you might be uh, excited by this news. Has anyone in chat gotten this? Yes, actually, wow. several. Man. They know they're 98 light gun shooters on ps1 they fucking do. <laughs> all two of them we always try to pull the wool over their eyes but they're they're on all top right. of it 
You fucking, I'm tapping out. Yeah, right there's now. no way, dude. The events of the game are framed through the character Tagami, a secret character in Shikigami no Shiro, which is another title developed by Alpha System. Uh, a mysterious figure travels the world in which the game is set many centuries after the main events conclude in order to investigate what caused the world's destruction. Oh, How does no! that even make sense? Oh, not Something the destroyed the world and he travels the world to just figure out what destroyed we it. Gotta get, we gotta get through the world, man. We gotta figure man, out what happened my, to this world. My, listen, you blew my mind before I'm gonna blow your mind with uh, Dwarf Fortress magic, so. Uh, dude. Oh, it was published by Working Designs also, if you needed to know that one. No, you've got zero uh, percent. What if I tell you the name in Japanese? Oh no, it's a two-part name. Gen Gensai Yoko Gensi Kiyoko Sairi Kidodan. Weird shoes. Hitotsu Onagashimas. All right. Konnichiwa, Senpai-san. All right, just go ahead and take the W on this one. This is Elemental Gear Bolt. Wow. Uh, it has a nice shiny it. cover. You can see yeah, it's got, it's got the, opalescent like iridescence going on with it. It's got that Pokemon holographic card feel the, to it. That double oh, double yeah. decker mm -hmm. CD case I was talking oh, about. I'm familiar with that. Oh no, the back has a crack in it. No. Oh, All my of God. my value. Wait, Let's value find gone. out how much this is worth. Yeah. My value. Right this is a... What is the name of the game again? What's the name? Elemental Gear Bolt. Mm. Mental gear. Congrats to Brim Throne for being, I think, the first person who got that. By now. Oh, shit. Just it's like a hundred dollar much... game. Whoa. God okay. damn it. The one time it's actually worth something, it's got a crack in the case. Oh, you're fucked, dude. This this thing is. I'm fucked. I'm out. 119. 80, 80 bucks easy, dude. What am I going to do? Kanichiwa, Minasan. <laughs> My value. <laughs> you know I don't speak Konnichiwa. French. I thought you said the word gun was in the game name. No, I just said it, it's a good guess because it's a gun game. I didn't say it was the title, though. Mm. Hell yeah, dog. I was, uh, I was so sure I was going to get that when you said it was a light gun shooter released in 1998 on the PS1. I was ready for it, but... Yeah, you know all the main names. Yeah. You don't know the, the back alleys of uh, light gun shooters. <laughs> Do you want me to blow your mind with Dwarf Fortress up before we start? Yeah, out? go ahead. All right, I... here we go. What? No, Ryan, you don't? <laughs> Ryan says no. <laughs> Just leave. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Here's the the leading question from PC Gamer mm -hmm. was, uh, how does teleportation? If Dwarf Fortress is about like, simulating existence, how does it work? Um, don't you think it would affect every aspect of the world? Mm -hmm. And then he's like, yeah, that's the problem. Uh, it's about telling them what teleportation does, what it's used for, and linking that to their general behaviors, like walking around. The example I gave where a person that's returning a gemstone to somebody in these new artifact quests or whatever, uh, they know where to get it. They know how to go on a journey. They know how teleportation has the mechanic to link you to that person. It's how we do it then. Now that, uh, it's how we do it now when we have a cat licking itself. It knows the action is about cleaning contaminants off their body. That's what it does. So they interrogate what that action does. We give them helpful hints so they don't have to oh read the code god. themselves. Oh my god. It's, it's just, if I do this, these things will happen. Then they have in their head that they want to accomplish this goal, and they have a little menu of things that they can accomplish with uh, for them. And so hopefully, you never know, teleportation would just me, uh, be a menu item. <laughs> but if it were something harder, like the price of teleportation is uncontrolled nausea for a week, or you lose a quarter of your blood, or something like that, I don't know how much, people, uh, how much blood people can live without, but you're just completely out of it for a week or month, there's still cases where teleportation is valuable. So then you need to teach them that sort of a cost-benefit analysis type thing, which I don't want to be ah! too flippant, but it's not much different from having a different uh, movement ah! value. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> That's enough. That's enough, Dwarf Fortress. Stop I mean, imagine people teleporting and splashing a quarter of their blood on the ground as they leave. <laughs> so That's what the hell has happened. Like, he's teaching the AI like cost ben that's, analysis oh benefits. Oh my, that's fucking and, ridiculous. So it's not Skynet that becomes self-aware, it's, it's Dwarf, Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress. That becomes you know, like, I rag on Rob sometimes, because <laughs> Rob is like, I have an idea for a game, but <laughs> yeah. not the skills as of yet yeah. to execute it. They did it. <laughs> but this is why every studio needs one of those people to just be like, that's enough. <laughs> this thing's got to come out. 
<laughs> That's too much. Yeah. Set the uh, scope too far. But man. it's crazy that he already has in the game like the AI can differentiate cost analysis benefit, but then introducing magic to the world and having them it's have just to like, like a logical analyze function that. is just fucking insane. Man. <laughs> All right. That, that did blow my mind. <laughs> Rob's in chat. Oh, hey, Rob. <laughs> hey, Rob. <laughs> you know how we like to make fun of Rob as a shell of a human being, but that's just, you know, that's neither here nor there. Well, that's just life. <laughs> He's a parody of one, not a oh, shell. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's what it was. I love you, Rob. Hey. Me too. Thanks for watching this episode of uh, Roundtable Live, everybody. That's going to do it for us. We appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for watching here on twitch.tv slash roundtablepodcast. That's where you'll catch us live every Friday here at 3 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh, look forward to the VOD over on our YouTube channels. That's Rockley Smile, Mathis Games, and Bear Taffy on YouTube.com. You can also follow the show's Twitter handle at RoundtablePC and discuss the show over, over on our subreddit, roundtablepodcast.reddit.com. Thank you very much to our Patreon supporters over on patreon.com slash roundtable. Over uh, there, you can support the show for as little as a dollar or as much as you want. Per month and keep us going. We really appreciate that. The pledges this week at the twenty or this yeah this week at the twenty dollar level and above come from Julian Avelsgard, Scrotty one one nine, Jonathan Graham, John Kalchik, O Thomas Games VR, Jakar Sampson with a dance number, Sehoa Kolnar, Jamie Tinsley, Joseph Boss, Ben Gillette, Michael Bush Larson, Talks to Wall, TJ Majesty, Chaos We're No Strangers to the Love Theorist. Colby Klein, Greenlight, Oren Saltzman, Christopher Flagg, Brizzlebrip, Eric Schooley, Myth Scarab, Positron, Mediocrities, Justin Samurfett, and Logan Ray. Thank you all very much again for your maintained support and pledges on Patreon.com slash Roundtable. And thank you all very much for watching. We'll be back next week here on Twitch.tv slash Roundtable Podcast. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. See you all. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Later. Well, there we go.